And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, to speak to and move the motion in his name. Uh, Presiding officer, it's a privilege once again to represent the fishing industry ahead of this year's December Council. Let me start by reiterating my admiration and my respect for the industry and its achievements and at a more personal level for the resilience and the sheer bravery of Scottish fishermen themselves. As we face the uncertainties of Brexit, this resilience and determination will be called upon as we fight to deliver the best deal possible, both at this year's December Council and in the longer term as well. At this time, I'm dismayed that the UK government's negotiations with the EU have still not delivered clarity on a host of critical issues that all of us, individuals, communities, industry and governments so badly need. We are on the edge of an economically damaging separation from the EU without any real assurances on the terms of our departure or our future relationship with the EU and other nations. The postponement of today's meaningful vote on the withdrawal agreement does absolutely nothing to bring that clarity and quite, in fact, quite the reverse. The disarray engulfing the UK government has muddied the waters even further. That the UK government could even have countenanced a draft withdrawal agreement so obviously detrimental to Scottish interests after there being no substantive engagement with the Scottish government is not a coincidence. Rather, it's confirmation that a UK government sees Scottish interests as entirely expendable. Although this is not the subject of today's debate, it's imperative that Scotland's voice is heard when the UK is establishing a deal on fisheries relations with the EU. It's my intention to champion the views and priorities of the Scottish industry in any and all scenarios. And it's also essential, presiding officer, that we carry on with the day job. I'm determined to approach this year's quota negotiations with a business as usual attitude. Presiding officer, let me summarize where we are in this year's negotiations so far. Uh, it's fair to say that this year's scientific advice from ICES has been challenging. There have been bright spots, including increases advised for some stocks, such as Northern Shelf Saith, Hake, Monkfish and Megrim, and further afield for Rockall Haddock and Atlanto Scandian Herring Ash. There has also been more positive news for West of Scotland nephrops after last year's difficult negotiations. However, across a range of other important stocks, the advice has been more difficult. Some of our most important pelagic stocks, including mackerel, blue whiting, and North Sea herring, presented advice for significant cuts next year. Similarly, in the North Sea, a number of our key whitefish stocks, such as cod, haddock, and whiting, all had cuts advised. And in the west of Scotland, cod and whiting stocks remain intractably low and no catches are advised. Significant cuts and low or zero level quota clearly present very difficult choke risks in 2019, the first year where the landing obligation will apply to all quota stocks. We continue to have an active role in the EU's regional groups to drive forward the development of innovative solutions to choke risks. And at next week's December Council, it's essential that all member states embrace the spirit of finding collective solutions to the remaining choke risks. We must prevent a situation where our fleet is being tied up when there is still quota available to fish. We're working tirelessly to address these challenges. Uh, I can assure the Chamber that the resolution of such choke risks is my absolute top priority at next week's Council in Brussels. Of course, the scientific advice may not translate directly into the final quota for next year. The negotiations themselves are where balances and compromises sometimes need to be found. As usual at this point, this year's negotiations are well underway and have already delivered strong outcomes in some of these areas. After protracted negotiations, the coastal states have finally reached agreement on fishing levels in 2019 for mackerel, blue whiting and Atlanto Scandian herring. For mackerel, Scotland's single most valuable stock, this government was influential in delivering a principled and justified approach to limiting the advised cut to minus 20% delivering a benefit to Scotland of around £101 million. 
However, the coastal states have once again failed to agree comprehensive sharing agreements for these uh, important and valuable stocks. This means it's likely they will continue to be fished beyond agreed levels in 2019. At this year's November Council, quota levels for a number of deep sea stocks in 2019 and 2020 were agreed. These are important bycatch quota that will allow the Scottish fleet to continue to target other important shelf edge fisheries, such as monkfish, under the landing obligation in 2019. This year's negotiations between the EU and Norway have been particularly difficult and delayed because of a number of unforeseen complications. The negotiations finally concluded in principle on Friday evening, but due to time constraints, full details of the verbally agreed deal have yet to be provided in writing. This is unsatisfactory, but it's not in our gift to control the wider process. Needless to say, my officials will scrutinize the agreement in great detail when it does appear. I'm fully expecting it to confirm as good a deal as could be hoped for in the context of difficult scientific advice. The advice cuts to North Sea cod and herring have been limited to minus 33% and minus 36% respectively, and we have secured the advised increases for safe and place of plus 16% and plus 11% respectively. In the exchange of quota with Norway, we have again delivered a package of inward transfers of North Sea opportunities that will help to avoid choke risks in 2019. And we have successfully reduced the outward transfer of blue whiting. Moving on, the EU Faro talks are underway in Brussels as I speak and are expected to conclude tomorrow. This agreement allows for the essential quota and access opportunities to Faroese waters for our whitefish fleet. In contrast, reciprocal agreements, uh, arrangements which allow Faroese vessels access to fish some of their quota of key stocks, including mackerel, in our waters are unutilized by the Scottish fleet. I'm pleased to report that this year sees the end to the private deal the Commission struck in 2014 granting inappropriately high levels of access for Faroese vessels to fish mackerel in our waters. I will seek to reduce in percentage terms the level of Faroese access for mackerel next year. And finally, this year's negotiations uh, will culminate at next week's December Council in Brussels, which will negotiate the remaining stocks fished solely by EU fleets in EU waters. My focus at the Council will be to ensure that good scientific advice is converted into actual quota to resist cuts where there are scientifically justifiable reasons for so doing and to continue to secure other outcomes linked to tackling choke risks. Standing officer Brexit has loomed large during these negotiations on fishing opportunities. Negotiation dynamics are certainly different this year given this wider political landscape. Technically, this year's talks have been business as usual, given we are still a member state. However, as expected, the wider scenarios still in play around Brexit are having some upstream influence in what we may expect to achieve at this year's talks. This may make things more difficult, but potentially in some ways it could give us a lever that we haven't had before. The Commission will wish to strike a deal that the UK is happy with and will honour during 2019 in the event of no deal. Third countries such as Norway, Faroes and Iceland also wish to agree stable fisheries arrangements uh, agreements in 2019 and the Commission will no doubt have taken these points into account. We are of course working hard behind the scenes. My officials have already been preparing the ground with the European Commission and with many others who have a say in final outcomes. Much is achieved well before we arrive in Brussels. We still have outstanding issues with choke species, particularly North Sea Ling and West of Scotland cod and whiting. We've been working with industry proactively to generate solutions uh, to avoid the fleet being tied up. In the final preparations for December Council, we'll use the full weight of the Scottish Government to get solutions in place. It's vital that the UK Government understands the need to prioritise practical and pragmatic solutions and that message is delivered loud and clear in Brussels. As such, I've reiterated our concerns to George Eustace ahead of the Council itself. In conclusion, presiding officer, we can see that the autumn negotiations are complex, 
This year they take place in an increasingly complex political landscape. What is clear is my commitment to ensure that these talks bring about the best possible outcome for our fishing industry and have Scotland's best interests at heart. <coughs> Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Peter Chapman to speak to and move Amendment 15096.4. I thank you, Presiding Officer. And <clears throat> it has been a pleasure and a privilege to work with the fishing industry this year, and I am pleased to speak on their behalf in this important debate, to open for the Scottish Conservatives today, and to move the amendment in my name. The industry got some good news yesterday when David Mundell visited the Peterhead fish market, which was actually bursting at the seams with over 9,000 boxes of prime fish on the floor. And let me tell you, that is quite a sight. And Mr. Mundell announced another 37.2 million of extra funding for fishing to be spent during the transition period of which Scotland gets 16.4 million. And the past year has been a good one, a profitable one for the catching sector, with both good catches and good prices. And in Peterhead, the new fish market has proved its worth and sold a record weekly total of 36,241 boxes in the last week of November. So the investment of 51 million pounds in deepening the harbour and building the new market has been fully justified. However, looking forward to next year, things aren't looking so rosy. We are facing cuts to many of our pelagic and our whitefish stocks, mainly in line with scientific advice. And North Sea Cod is to take a 33% cut. The advice was actually for 47%. Haddock is to take a 31% cut as per advice. Whiting to take a 22% cut as per advice. And Herring to take a 36% cut, where the advice was actually for a 51% cut. And mackerel, our biggest and most valuable stock, is to take a cut of 20%, where again the advice was originally for a 60% cut. On the plus side, quotas for SAFE are up 16%, place are up 11%, both as per scientific advice. And the total allowable catch for monkfish and hake will be set at the December Fisheries Council, and the various changes to TACs I have already discussed will be ratified at that time. And it must be said that these quota cuts to some of our most important species at a time when the landing obligation comes fully into force are unhelpful at the very least and could be disastrous at the worst. The reduction in North Sea cod could make it a choke species alongside others including West of Scotland cod and, and hake. The landing obligation is explicit that catches of all regulated species, those that have quotas, must be brought ashore. Once the quota for any choke species is caught, the fleet must stop fishing. There is therefore a significant and real risk that tens of millions of pounds worth of fish could go on uncaught as a result. Now the Cabinet Secretary speaks in his motion about exploring all available solutions in regard to choke species. So can the Cabinet Secretary today give some clarity to us as to what action he will take to avoid early closure of our fisheries. There is also now real concern on the number of foreign vessels operating within the Scottish sector, mostly in waters around Shetland. A recent survey carried out by the sector found a total of 122 foreign vessels in Shetland waters. Now these were made up of 19 UK with foreign flagged vessels, 12 Spanish, 33 Norwegians, 8 German, 27 French and 23 Danish vessels. Now these foreign vessels are all targeting whitefish and to give some scale, the Scottish fleet has only 85 vessels targeting whitefish. So this is a significant increase in foreign vessels from previous years and it now seems that the that other member states have exhausted their own stocks and are encroaching north and west to catch the very species we have worked hard to protect and rebuild over a number of years. So I just wonder, does Mr. Pardon? I'll take an intervention. Mark um, the, the member talks about foreign vessels coming to our waters. Isn't that exactly the situation that the French have faced this year with the Scottish fleet encroaching 
on waters in the English Channel. Peter Chapman. That, that argument was, was uh, we, we, our fishing boats were completely in the right in that argument. The, the French were, weren't supposed to be fishing in these waters and we were allowed to fish in these waters. And to be quite honest, their, their reaction to our boats was, was uh, absolutely illegal and we can never support what went on there. So I asked, does Mr. Ewan agree that this level of foreign fishing pressure is unsustainable and is completely unfair in our fishermen? And I wonder what can be done to protect our stocks from this excessive fishing pressure. Another anomaly which rightly annoys our fishermen is the annual swap of 100,000 tonnes of blue whiting to Norway, of which our share is 20,000 tonnes. And in return for that, the EU gets 21,500 tonnes of Arctic cod. Now, this is no use to our fishermen. We get no benefit from this because these cod are all caught by Spain and Portugal. So we must push for Spain and Portugal to pay their share of blue whiting transfer to Norway to mitigate the cut to the Scottish fleet. Now, the EU faro negotiations, as we heard from Mr Ewan, will take place today and tomorrow. And this agreement is also heavily skewed in favour of the Faroe Islands. And the Faroese cut something like 45 million pounds worth of mackerel in Scottish waters, while the entire EU fleet cuts only 5 million pounds worth in Faroe waters. So again, we need to push for the reduction of Faroese mackerel access during this week's negotiations. As I said, last year or this year has been good for our skippers. However, the fish processing sector has seen a decrease in capacity from 2008 to 2016, there's been a 34% decline in fish processing capacity in, in Northeast Scotland. We are losing business and jobs to Humberside, where fish processing is growing. We are uncompetitive due in great measure to high business rates, and we need to reverse this trend to handle the extra fish, which the sea of opportunity will undoubtedly bring. I can do. Alistair Allen. Thank the member for giving way. Uh, I'm sure, uh, like myself, he's, he's spoken to fish processing firms uh, in his part of Scotland. Uh, has, has he not noticed that they've mentioned, above all other concerns they have, the supply of a workforce and what Brexit will mean for that? Peter the, wor the workforce is, is absolutely an issue. But these declines have been going on for nearly 10 years, long before anybody ever spoke about Brexit. So it's not just about that. Um, Presiding officer, never in the history of UK politics have our fishermen and our fish processors had such a high profile. I would guess that fishing has been mentioned at the dispatch box in Westminster more often in the last six months than it has been in the previous 40 years. This proves just how important this industry is to our party and indeed our Prime Minister. Fishing matters to the Conservatives. We are the only party who recognise and are fighting to obtain the sea of opportunity that Brexit brings. Quite frankly, I am disgusted with the way that this SNP government and indeed the Labour opposition try to suggest that we will sell out this industry. <laughs> Presiding officer, it is rank hypocrisy of the most blatant kind. We are the only party working hard to deliver on the instructions of the people to come out of the EU and to take control of our borders our money and our waters. And that means coming out of the CFP and taking the shackles off our fishermen. I've taken three already, so no. It has been blatantly obvious to us all that this SNP government has used the Brexit vote as a weapon to build more and more grievance between here and Westminster in the hope of levering another independence Absolutely. referendum. In fact, this tactic has changed again. And the First Minister made it abundantly clear at FMQ's last week that she wants to stop Brexit in its tracks. So the message to our fishermen is clear. The message to our fishermen is clear. The SNP will do everything they possibly can to keep you in the hated CFP. No chance of taking control of our EEZ. No chance of redressing the balance where we only catch 40% of the fish in our waters. No chance of coming up with solutions to the landing obligation and no chance of growing prosperity in our coastal communities. And I just wonder, how many members in chamber today have signed the SFF pledge? We all have. 
I also wonder how many members in the chamber from the opposition benches have actually spoken to our fishermen recently. Mm -hmm. Because I have, I have, I hosted a meeting with David Duke 10 days ago where, where we sat down with 30 members of the industry, including skippers and processors. And I was at Peterhead Fish Market only yesterday morning with David Mundell, where we again talked with the industry. And the message was clear on both occasions. They want the only deal on the table to go through. They recognize this deal will deliver what they need and what they voted for in 2016. This deal gives us a, a degree of certainty, whereas voting down this deal creates chaos. Of course, chaos is exactly what the SNP and the Labour want for their own political motives. No thought about what would be best for our country. No thought that our fishermen want this deal. No thought that our business leaders want this deal. Not, no, the only thought from the opposition is, let's just vote this down and try to gain some political advantage out of the chaos. Yeah. Presiding officer, this is politics at its worst. This deal, this deal isn't perfect, but it is the only game in town and is pragmatic and workable. Presiding officer, our fishermen will never forget and will never forgive the SNP if they prevent us from leaving the hated and the discredited CFP. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Rhoda Grant to speak to and move Amendment 15096.1. Thank you, presiding officer. I was going to try very hard to avoid Brexit in today's um, debate, but given that Peter Chapman didn't amend his own speech in light of the fact that there is to be no vote on the deal in the UK Parliament this week, um, I would think that I need to turn to that and say very clearly the reason that we are concerned about the deal being put before to be put before the Westminster Parliament at some point in the future is that it keeps people in the CFP. We will have no negotiating rights and should the backstop come into force, not only will we be in the CFP but we will also have to negotiate trade arrangements and that's certainly not good for our fishermen. So I think you can sign any pledge you like but if you're actually working against the, inst the, the, the good of our fishing community, I don't think that carries any weight at all. Presiding officers, there's been years um, when this debate was all about cutting effort and quotas and tough decisions for our fishing communities. And there are still tough decisions to be made, but if those difficult decisions taken back then have led to recovery of stocks, if that t teaches us anything, it's that we should manage the seas to make sure that there are fish there in abundant supply for our future generations. And Brexit has drawn attention away from the year-end fisheries negotiations. And we have to make sure that the pantomime that is Brexit doesn't distract us from some of the big, fish, uh, big issues surrounding the negotiations this year. Um, not only will the outcome of these negotiations be the foundation for what we go forward into Brexit with, if it ever happens, it will also affect our fishing community um, what, what they will be doing in the coming year. And our amendment recognises that there will be increased quotas in prawns in the West Coast and in other fisheries where stocks continue to rise. We're asking the Scottish Government to look to distribute this to provide the maximum economic benefit to our rural communities while safeguarding this quota from being traded away. This would create a foundation for Brexit that must lead to a greater allocation of quota to our rural communities, while also preparing to step up our effort in preparation for a greater share of our fishery eventually. In some of our island communities, um, they lead the way on this already. They have kept quota in public hands and they lease it out to the fishing community. And this means that it can't be traded away or gain an inflated value that puts it out of the reach of new entrants to the industry. If new quota was distrib distributed this way through local authorities or even through community ownership, where there is a distinct community, then it can be leased out to local fishermen and new entrants. Priority should be given where practical to smaller boats rooted in their communities in order to provide the maximum economic impact on remote rural areas. 
those working on these boats are more likely to live and spend their earnings in their communities. And this also provides the opportunity to be innovative with licences too. The Scottish Government could keep ownership of the licences but lease them out. And this would prevent leakage of these licences elsewhere or to be traded as we've seen in the past. And in order to keep those assets providing the maximum economic benefit, we should keep them in public ownership to be leased rather than traded. In order to attract new entrants, funding would also be needed to help with the purchase of boats. And this will no doubt be commercially available if a business can show that they've got access to a licence and quota. However, it may be that small grants are required to provide a degree of collateral. This would allow us to maximise the benefit of the new quota while also gearing up for Brexit. However, it's not just catching but processing that we need to increase. Processing creates jobs and adds value. Where possible, it should be carried out in our rural communities. And this needs workforce planning and training. And there are workforce issues currently affecting processing, and this will get worse with Brexit and its impact on migration. It's sad that we see salmon processing factories close down and others relocate when we need this part of the industry to grow. It might be that we need to change how these factories work to look at other species, but we need that infrastructure and that workforce. To do that, we need to make sure that it's seen as an attractive career choice and make sure that the infrastructure is available for workers to live within these communities. They need houses, schools and services. And if we provide these um, steps, we can then take steps towards repopulation. If we're going to reap the benefit of increased catches, we must now plan for the workforce to capitalise on that, both in the catches, catching and processing sectors. We agree with the discard ban, but it's very disappointing that, it, that there is as yet no solution to choke species. When there is no quota for the bycatch, then the fishing industry cannot catch their quota of the species that they're lawfully pursuing, regardless of the amount of quota they hold for that. And every year, this time of year, I have argued that the Scottish Government or local authorities should own quota for choke species. If they own that quota, they could make it available to those who have to land a bycatch. They could lease that quota at a cost that neither encouraged nor discouraged its landing, but crucially allowed the industry to continue to fish. Further, there must be use made of everything that's landed. Because of the advances in selective fishing, we're catching less and less bycatch, and that means that there are fewer uses for it. I understand that traders are not interested because of the small quantities involved, and this means it's difficult to dispose of. Again, I believe the Scottish Government must step in to ensure that bycatch is put to good use. Failure to do this will mean it will not be landed. And even if it were landed, but left to rot at the quayside, then it's just as bad. It would be better discarded at sea. At least it would feed the birds and sea life. Therefore, finding a solution to this problem is now essential. While we need to develop even more selective fishing methods, it's realistic to prepare for some bycatch. The smaller that bycatch, the more difficult it is to find uses for it and a market to sell it. And therefore, we must um, step in and find a solution for fisheries that are affected in this way. Can I turn briefly to the other amendments? Um, we will support the Liberal Democrat Amendment. And while we have sympathy for the Green Amendment, it is too widely drafted and would apply to static, static gear boats. It's widely accepted that static gear is the most selective form of fishing, and these small boats are community-based, which makes them crucial to the rural economy. They're also the boats that have the narrowest margins, and I do not believe the Greens meant to add to their costs um, or thought that they needed to be tracked in the way that this amendment suggests. We cannot support the Conservative amendment. While we recognise that this was an aspiration of the fishing community, the deal that we have on the table does not do this. In fact, it does the very opposite. Keeping fishing within the parameters of the CFP without a role in the negotiations while in the long run leaving them open to export levies. The worst possible of both worlds. Presiding officer, these negotiations are crucial to our industry while these talks are not 
participated with the trepidation that they once were. Um, we cannot be complacent. We need to build on foundations for the future of the industry and plan how we reap the highest economic benefit for, for our rural communities. We need to build a workforce and infrastructure to do that. To miss this opportunity would be to let down future generations. Thank you very much. I call Mark Ruskell uh, to be followed by Tavish Scott. Mark Ruskell to open for the Greens. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. So the Green Amendment this afternoon allows me to return to a subject I spoke about in last year's debate, which is the urgent need for the full tracking and monitoring of our fishing fleet. In just the last month, two incidents of illegal scallop dredging in Loch Gerloch and Wester Ross have caused untold devastation to our marine ecosystems. The Firth of Lorne was subject to similar destructive dredging in February, Whilst few of us can forget the shocking footage of the decimated seabed of Loch Caron last year, which forced emergency action by the Scottish Government to protect our precious flame shell reefs. We know that it's a tiny minority of the fishing sector that engages in this illegal activity, but every time an incident is reported, the public loses a little more faith, and the environmental and scientific community rightly question the commitment to protecting our seas. So we have to urgently look at a full and comprehensive monitoring scheme for our fishing fleet that builds confidence in the sector whilst addressing the pressing issues that are facing our fish stocks and our ecology. Yes, yeah, so we'll give them. My grumbles. This is done by a very tiny minority. Why then does you think it's important to have monitoring technology on ev all Scottish fishing vessels? Mark Russell. Well, it is, um, but of course, it's not just about monitoring and compliance. It's also about data gathering, and it's also about creating a level playing field. We need to support those who are acting legally, who are employing monitoring technology at the moment, by extending that across the whole fleet. And I think most, most fishers there would, uh, would welcome such a commitment. Um, so, remote, um, I need to make a little bit of progress. I'll maybe take Mr. Chapman a little bit later on. Um, so remote electronic monitoring, or REM for short, is the most up-to-date system available, which combines satellite tracking with sensors and CCTV on board fishing vessels. And it goes beyond the vessel monitoring systems currently used in the industry, as it can provide near live information, not just about where a vessel is, but when it is actively fishing. And it also captures video footage of the crew's behavior and imagery of the fish catches which can be reviewed for both compliance and scientific purposes. Now, REM has been trialled in the UK through the fully documented fisheries scheme with positive results. However, in Scotland, this is concentrated mostly on North Sea cod and is entirely voluntary. Participation peaked with 32 vessels in 2014 and since then has declined. A rollout of fully documented fisheries in the scallop sector has been limited only to the largest boats meaning that only 14 of the 94 scallop dredges registered in Scotland are fitted with REM. Full fleet coverage would likely have prevented the illegal fishing we have witnessed this year. I'll take Mr. Chan. <coughs> Thank Chan. the member for taking the intervention. His, his motion speaks about the monitoring and policing the Scottish fleet. Why doesn't he think they need to monitor and, fleet and, and, the, and the, uh, police the EU fleet as well? Ruskell. Well, that's a, a very good point and something that, of course, could be taken forward through further reforms of the CFP. But, of course, we won't be in the CFP because we'll be taking rules rather than actually making rules. So we have to see the whole of Europe's uh, fisheries fleet move forward in terms of sustainable practice. Now, this is not prohibitively costly, costly technology. There's a WWF study last year reporting that it costs less than 3500 to fit out a vessel with REM. And currently, whilst we're in the EU, 90% of these costs are fundable from the EMFF fund. I appreciate the point raised by Rhoda Grant about other sectors that are perhaps less pressing in terms of installation monitoring technology. But these can be phased in over time, and we can look at appropriate solutions. The Cabinet Secretary, in a recent letter to my colleague John Finney, emphasised the important work that the University of St Andrews is doing, looking at appropriate monitoring uh, techniques and innovation. Now, the resulting onshore monitoring for a fully equipped fleet would be in the cost of uh, £5 million for the entire UK, which is a quarter of the cost of our current monitoring scheme, which relies on onboard observers and dockside monitoring. The data provided by a full fleet REM scheme would greatly surpass our current system, under which less than 1% of fishing activity is being monitored at sea. 
The data is more consistent and can be gathered over a longer period of time, allowing for better quality scientific monitoring of our fish stocks. And I would argue that REM is the only way we can look meaningfully at solutions to choke species while respecting the scientific advice as the government motion today commits us to. Now, I welcome the recent announcement of additional funding from the Scottish Government for the monitoring and tracking of inshore fisheries. But piecemeal programs across different sectors do not go far enough. We need a commitment to installing remote electronic monitoring across our full fishing fleet in time if we're to reap the benefits that it will bring. There is precedent for this. New Zealand will complete a rollout next month of a digital monitoring scheme, which will see all licensed fishing vessels fitted with electronic catch and positioning reporting and CCTV. A cost-benefit analysis prior to introduction in New Zealand concluded the system have a net benefit of over 75 million New Zealand dollars in the first 15 years. And their government has recognized that monitoring is not solely a policing issue. It's also a way to demonstrate the sustainability of the native fisheries to consumers and to identify and address any threats as early as possible. Numerous studies and reports have shown that the fishing industry in the UK is largely supportive of REM, as it is the best way to demonstrate that the majority of our fleet are fishing legally and sustainably. So to conclude, presiding officer, remote electronic monitoring can tackle illegal fishing in our inshore waters. It can monitor and address the landing obligation and issues of choke species, while providing better scientific data than ever before on which to base future fisheries management. It's cost effective, which deliver long-term saving on monitoring regimes, largely supported by the industry, can rebuild confidence in the sustainability of our fishing fleet. And it has a positive role to play in nearly all of the issues that we'll be discussing in this chamber this afternoon. And I hope the government will today commit to a full fleet rollout as early as is practicable. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call uh, Tavish Scott to speak to and move the amendment in his name, 15096.2. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, with a week to go before the December EU Fisheries Council negotiations and with the EU Faroese bilateral on right as we speak, uh, today's de uh, debate in this Scottish Parliament should be about following the fish and not following the Prime Minister around Europe. Um, I'm not sure what the point of following the Prime Minister around Europe is um, at the moment. Indeed, the only Tories who seem to be following the Prime Minister are the Scottish Tories, and that is uh, still beyond me, particularly after what happened uh, last night. Now, to reassure Mr Chapman, I spent the whole of Monday with fishermen in Shetland. Um, the fishing industry uh, in the islands has had a strong 2018. Uh, fish landings are at the highest since 1972, are 10% up on 2017. Two new fish markets in Lerwick and Scalloway will open in 2020, doubling the capacity. Uh, new fleet tonnage is being ordered. Indeed, four new white fish vessels uh, should arrive in 2020 or there or thereabouts. And the youngest crew in the Scottish fleet, uh, all under 30, um, LK470, the Courageous, have had an outstanding year. Uh, 12 young Shetlanders have taken the introduction to fishing course, courses at the uh, Marine Centre uh, in Scalloway, and all are now working in the industry. Uh, there is a degree of financial confidence, uh, something that cannot be said of every one of these debates we uh, have in this place. And as seafood exports from Shetland exceed £300 million every year, what must government do to ensure that these numbers continue to improve to the benefit of both the local islands economy, but also that of the Scottish economy uh, too? Therefore, my one local ask of the Cabinet Secretary is not so much for him, but for his colleague, the Transport Minister. Shetland does not have enough freight capacity from Lerwick to Aberdeen on the nightly ships. So can the government ensure that when the new specification is set for the contract, uh, the shipping contract, beginning in October 2019, the future needs of the seafood industry will be accommodated? Those growth figures uh, have been provided to the government. Industry need to know that the greater tonnage of fish landed can be shipped south. Uh, we may come on to where it gets shipped thereafter, but that's for the other debate. The outlook for 2019, as uh, a number of uh, colleagues have mentioned this afternoon, is both challenging for whitefish and the pelagic catching and processing sectors. Uh, with whitefish, we know that the EU-Norway talks have concluded with a 33% cut in cod for the North Sea. I recognise, as does the industry, that the Scottish Government fought the initial ICES recommendation of a 47% cut uh, in conjunction with Norway uh, and, in, and with others. But cod will become a choke species. It's not a question of when or if. It will become a choke species, particularly in the northern North Sea, and therefore a major issue for the Shetland and northeast fleets around our coast. So the Cabinet Secretary does need to look at any measures that can mitigate against cod 
quota, tying boats up at the quay. Swaps with other EU states can help, and he may have hinted in that in his remarks uh, at the introduction to this debate. The industry have also proposed technical measures. These include real-time closed areas, uh, but such a measure, of course, must apply to all boats. Otherwise, we know from experience that vessels from other EU member states, and indeed Norway, uh, prosecute those areas when our boats uh, are held out with them. Uh, that must be a uh, new a policy uh, which covers all vessels fishing in this area. But it is a policy that works, has much to commend it, and I hope the government will take it forward in conjunction uh, with other EU states and indeed with Norway. A 31% cut in Haddock is worrying too, uh, but certainly in the Shetland fleet context, uh, the uh, vessels have not managed to take up their full quota allocation in uh, 2018, and therefore that uh, cut uh, may be balanced by changes elsewhere. There is a wider point about fisheries science I'd want to reflect. I want to propose to the Cabinet Secretary that he sets up an independent scientific peer review system of the IC's advice. That would allow the government to review fisheries data with specialist expert advice and construct long-term management plans just as Norway does. And I know his officials work closely uh, with Norwegian colleagues on these points. The Marine Centre in, in Scalloway and SAMS at Dunstaffenage both have scientific fisheries expertise. So why should our industry not benefit from that expertise and enhance the industry's scientific understanding? This new approach to science also needs to tackle the changes in the Northern North Sea compared to the Southern North Sea that all, the entire industry knows all too well about. Water temperature has had an impact on where stocks are thriving uh, and indeed staying. Fisheries management need to understand that. Secondly, I would beef up Marines, the Marine Scotland Observer Program on boats. Uh, and thirdly, I would suggest to the Minister that the EMF funding, which is paid for the Scottish Fishermen's Federation Observer work, is maintained through the chaos of Brexit and whatever future uh, will happen. We know IC science is not foolproof. No science ever can be. And to suggest it is, is not to understand the nature of science of fish. Read the EU-Norway agreement from Bergen, 2nd of December 2016. On Haddock, it was found that an IC error had resulted in a 45% cut in Haddock quarter at that time. That's what went through. Uh, my proposal to help, would help to guard against such massive fluctuations by ensuring some peer review of this advice. It would allow fisheries management to verify the science and avoid those vast disruptions in the marketplace. Because what happened the year after 47% had it cut? Well, as the agreement shows, uh, the quota was increased by 27%. Again, huge swings in tonnage landed. And that, of course, does nothing for the processing sector or for the markets that we are seeking to supply. Avoiding such an approach would be in the long-term interest of science, in the long-term interest of stock management, and therefore of the industry, and must make some sense. Uh, on Pelagic, as the Minister rightly mentioned, EU Norway has gone through five negotiating rounds this year, finally agreeing a 36% cut in herring quota. Again, another huge variation. And mackerel is set to be cut by 20%, down from the 68% cut the scientists recommended. Now, again, the peer review would help in this process, because as the Minister will well know, the scientific fish tagging program has not worked as expected. It has not proved the science, it has not been able to prove the science as we would all uh, wish. So the Scottish Government were effective in those quota negotiations, and I want to recognise and thank them for that. A 20% cut is precautionary and is a better outcome, all but one that has consequences for both the catching fleet and the processing industry of the, of the, uh, of the uh, stock that is the most important to the Scottish industry in terms of value. Finally, presiding officer, the EU Faro bilateral is happening as we debate this afternoon. It is not just about quota share, but about the access to, EU, uh, to UK waters. In this macro fishery, that means the Northern North Sea. The current arrangement is unacceptable to the industry, and I'm pleased to say the Scottish Government, I agreed with Peter Chapman's assessment uh, of that process and the Cabinet Secretary's remarks earlier. 30% of the fairies macro quota can be caught in our waters. The boats, their boats catch more by volume in Shetland's coast layer than the Shetland fleet combined. I'm sure Parliament can recognise 
that such a deal is hardly construed as equitable. That must change, and I ask the Cabinet Secretary to make that argument and use uh, that negotiating position uh, next week uh, in Brussels. Yes, Scotland does uh, gain some demersal access in Faeries waters, some from the North East and one vessel from uh, Shetland, but that value is but one-tenth of the pelagic gain for Faro, and as the Cabinet Secretary knows, uh, that does indeed need to change. Uh, this is, Presiding Officer, a hugely important December Fisheries Council. The Scottish fishing industry need to have successful outcomes, both to mitigate the proposals that are not based on solid science, and there are a few of those, and to take a long-term perspective to stock management. Uh, the Minister and his team certainly have my support in seeking to achieve these important objectives next week. Thank you very much. That concludes our opening speeches. We're going to move into the open part of the debate. Just to let members know there are, there's plenty of time this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to call Stuart Stevenson to be called by Edward Mountain. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I did a quick sum before coming down. I think this is my 11th or 12th uh, speech on the fisheries negotiations uh, since coming here. Uh, but each year has its own individual tempo and own individual issues. But the one thing that endures is that the fishermen's representatives, be it the SFF, the S, uh, SBWFA or others, uh, don't choose any political party. In fact, they want all of us uh, to be their allies in the fisheries negotiation uh, and throughout the year. And uh, I'm certainly up for that. Um, I first uh, attended uh, Fisheries Council as a backbencher with our shadow fisheries minister, Richard Lockett, in 2002. It perfectly illustrated uh, the issue in that uh, the commissioner at that time was Franz Fischler uh, from Austria, a country with no coast whatsoever and no interest whatsoever in the common fisheries policy. Uh, we met uh, Maya Kirchner, uh, who was... Uh, his assistant and advisor. She was a lawyer, not a fishing scientist, and not a fishing person. And doesn't that neatly capture uh, many of the problems of the way uh, that Europe uh, deals uh, with fishing? Um, it might also be as well, just to remind colleagues, that the first and so far only debate we've had in this parliament on the SFF's uh, Sea of Opportunity uh, was one that I brought forward and received uh, support from right across the chamber. So we don't need to argue about whether we agree uh, with the Sea of Opportunity. We clearly do, and we shouldn't create false barriers that suggest uh, anything uh, other uh, than that. Now, fishermen are, if they're anything, uh, certainly hunters, but they're also conservationists because they know if you don't leave fish in the sea this year, there'll be none there for them to hunt next year and for their sons and their grandsons and for their communities to hunt in the future. So we should listen to our fishermen. Their landing obligation in the form that it has come from Europe uh, has presented a substantial problem. We've heard reference to that already. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation, in the briefing that they sent to me, uh, referred to choke species, uh, and that is uh, certainly uh, a big issue. It's one that at the meetings of the Northeast Fisheries Development Partnership, uh, which I uh, attend pretty much all the time, missed one or two, I think, in the last 10 years or so, uh, it comes up every single time, and uh, properly, uh, properly so. Um, I just make the wee passing comment to uh, what Peter Chapman said about business rates that Seafish uh, has briefed us and that shows that the rateable value per square foot uh, in Peterhead is virtually the same as it is in Grimsby and it's actually lower in Fraserburgh and it's as well uh, to remember that there are more complex reasons for the structure of the industry, processing industry uh, being what it is. Uh, the Scottish Whitefish uh, Producers Association, uh, Peter Chapman has quoted uh, le at length from their briefing, uh, but the key point is it now seems that other member states and third countries have exhausted their own stokes and are encroaching north. And that is precisely the challenge that we have as the SWFPA uh, highlight uh, in the common fisheries policy where we give away access and get very little in return. They also highlight the issue of non-European economic area crew, 
Uh, and I think it's as well uh, to just footnote that, of course, uh, once we leave the EU, that will potentially be an issue for crew who may come uh, from the EU uh, as well. Now, we've had mention of the new fish market at Peterhead. Um, I was certainly delighted to help uh, uh, the board there with one or two issues that they had during its construction. It's something that I know of no one who is not supported. Mm. We are delighted to see the Duke of Rothsey up, uh, not only to open it, but also uh, to sit down and see fish gutting and eat some of the wonderful fish uh, that get landed at Peterhead and else, elsewhere. Uh, in 2017, I, of course, talked about 100% control of our water out to 200 miles, and that's something which I continue uh, to go for to this day. Uh, in 2016, I quoted myself, always a good source uh, to quote, when I, in turn, quoted from our European Committee in 2001. Uh, it said, we should speak with one voice, there is tensions that should be buried for the common good. And I hope that that advice all that time ago from our own parliamentary committee will be something that we'll uh, continue uh, to, uh, to tack tent of. Um, Jamie McGregor was here in 2015 and was always an excellent contributor to our debates. Uh, we talked about cod and my favourite uh, thing out the sea is cod row, so I hope uh, that we come on to that. 2014. The Faroes was being talked about then. And of course, the difficulty with the Faroes is that the Faroes can kind of just wait because with the change in temperature, the fish move north into their waters. So negotiations with the Faroes are always going to be difficult, but they need to be prosecuted uh, with considerable vigor. In 2006, I said we need a successful, sustainable industry. We may differ in the route to that about some of the difficulties we face in delivering that. It could be said today, it could be said every year. Um, I talked in 2004 about ISIS. Now, it's as well to remember ISIS has been around for more than 100 years. It is an important source uh, of information about the stocks and one uh, which we should depend on. We've heard a suggestion from Tavish Scott that it should be peer reviewed. I think it probably is, but you can never over peer review. Uh, so I've got some sympathy uh, with what, uh, what he says. Uh, let me just close by saying it's an important industry. Nearly 5,000 people are employed on Scottish based uh, vessels, but many, many more onshore uh, depend uh, on the industry. And of course, we've got to learn from the Scottish Government's experience over the years of sitting outside the chamber, that you can still influence what happens inside the council chamber. And I hope that the UK Government next year will not go there too pessimistic as they're outside the core decision making, but work with the Scottish Government as they always have done to reasonable, if not perfect effect, and learn how to manage things and get what we need when we're not actually sitting in the council chamber. Presiding officer. Uh, thank you. I call Edward Mountain, followed by Alistair Allen. Mr Mountain, didn't fast yourself? You can have up to seven minutes, even a wee bit more this time in hand. <laughs> Presiding officer, you're so generous. Thank you. Uh, another year end and another annual debate on next year's European fishing quotas. This year's EU-Norway talks on proposed fishing quotas will worry Scottish fishermen. There are pro proposed reductions in total allowable catch for mackerel, North Sea cod and haddock as we've heard. While most of this mainly is the result of scientific evidence, the result on some of the fish catches seems to fall particularly hard on Scottish fishermen. These are the key commercial stocks and, the couples, and this coupled with the landing obligations promise to make this next year a tough year for our fishing industry. Once again, we could see our fishermen when they reach their quota limit, having to hang up their nets and see millions of fish either landed by foreign vessels or go uncaught. Given all that has, is going on at the moment, as the Cabinet Secretary hinted to, it is perhaps unreasonable for us to expect the EU to give particular respect to our fishermen. I am not surprised, for one, that the EU27 will negotiate for the EU27. However, we know in future years this will change. And let me be clear, Scottish fishermen want nothing more than for the UK to leave the hated common fisheries policies and for the UK to take its place as an independent coastal state. 
And the Cabinet Secretary knows and acknowledge, has acknowledged this as well. When the UK has the power to negotiate our own fishing quotas, we have the potential to stop bad deals that are presented to us by the EU. When the UK sits at the table, it will be able to strike the bilateral deal with Norway on the, north, on the northern North Sea, on the tripartite deal with the EU and Norway on the southern sea. I believe that these deals will better serve the interests of Scottish fishermen. That's why I welcome the UK Fisheries Bill, which even the Cabinet Secretary has begrudgingly described as having broadly positive outcomes. And there's every reason for this SNP government to welcome the bill. This Parliament will receive more powers to regulate sea fisheries resources, to protect the marine environment, which we've heard from Mark Ruskell is so important. And I'm disappointed that your amendment is such that it limited the tracking to Scottish vessels. If it had gone wider than that, I feel that there would have been a measure of support from this side of the chamber. And it will also give the Scottish government the ability to issue licenses to, boat that f to boats that fish within waters controlled by Scotland. Now, I'd like to take a moment to remind this Scottish Government how unfair the common fisheries policy is. On average, EU vessels landed £540 million worth of fish in UK waters between 2012 and 2016. By comparison, UK vessels landed £110 million worth of fish in the same period in EU waters. That, to me, does not seem right and equitable, and we should not allow our fishermen to be shortchanged. Quotas and access rights will still be a central part of UK fisheries, but with the UK, we'll have a duty to get a best deal for our fishermen. We have a duty to ensure our quotas and access rights reflect sustainable goals so that the UK fishing industry as a whole can have a secure future for generations to come. And Cabinet Secretary, we don't need scientists to tell us that fish are not fixated on borders. They are not Scottish, English, Northern Irish or indeed Welsh, which is why the UK is best placed to ensure we co cooperate within the UK with others to ensure that the sustainable stocks are kept for the future. But cooperation shouldn't come at the cost of securing the best deal for the UK, and that's something that we need to strive to in the future. As a final point, I'd like to welcome the UK government's as an, uh, announcement, as uh, uh, pointed out by Mr Chapman, of an additional £37.2 million of extra funding to strengthen the UK fishing industry, which comes on top of the commitment to match the European Maritime uh, and Fisheries Fund. I believe a sea of opportunity awaits our fishing industry, and the government is determined to help fishermen seize it. The rural coastline communities in the highlands and islands, in the areas that the Cabinet Secretary and I both represent, know this opportunity is coming. So any attempts to frustrate our exit from the common fisheries policy would be a more than an insult to those communities. Presiding officer, every year when we have this debate, I'm struck by how the UK fishing fleet is being held back by the EU. If we stay within the EU, nothing will change. Our fishermen don't want that, the country doesn't want that, and it's time to respect the fact that now is the time to ditch the common fisheries policy. Presiding officer. And you didn't even use extra time. I don't know. I can't please you no matter what I do, Mr. Mountain. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Claudia Beamish, please, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <laughs> now, as others have mentioned, the uh, European fisheries talks this year have uh, it's been somewhat overshadowed by European negotiations of a different kind and by the toxic fallout from tonight's vote, or rather the lack of a vote in another place. But that doesn't make the fisheries talks any less important to fishing communities. But that said, it simply makes it impossible to talk about them this year without mentioning Brexit. And so I am not going to go through the motions of trying not to speak about Brexit. And amid all the ongoing absurdities, some of them were referred to by Stuart Stevenson, the absurdities of Austria and Luxembourg having votes in the EU Fisheries Council, but Scotland not, or the fact that Scotland and its elected parliament are being given no direct say over the direction of fishing post-Brexit. What should unite this parliament, and others have said it, is our determination to get the best possible deal from the talks, both for the Scottish fishing industry and for the environment. 
Now, the Prime Minister is still determined, as far as anyone can now really tell, to present a choice to fishermen between her deal and no deal. In the case of the former scenario, we now know that the UK itself is volunteering to give up the voting rights it now has to influence the process when it comes to fishing. Meanwhile, our fishing industry will only benefit from zero tariffs if an EU-UK uh, fisheries agreement has been reached that includes arrangements on access to waters and fishing opportunities. And as for the no deal option, I can but quote Lewis Macmillan, who catches prawns in Loch Fine. If there is a lineup of lorries at the border because of Brexit, you'll be in trouble. The prawns need to make it to Europe alive. And if there is no agreement on fishing access and shares, then trade, trade on these products will remain out with the customs union uh, or out with the customs territory and subject to WTO tariffs. Now, the National Coordinator of the Scottish Creel Fishermen's Federation, Alistair Sinclair, said that tariffs would hurt our margins and profitability and would dismantle 20 years of perfecting the current system overnight. There is the additional worry of what Brexit potentially means for the supply of a fish processing workforce. Now, I visited Macduff, Shellfish and Stornoway earlier in the year and that point was made very clear to me indeed. As a related aside, I should say the UK government's hostility to a concessionary visa scheme for non-EEA workers uh, could also have labour implications for fishing boat crewing, a point which Bar Atlantic Limited in the Isle of Barra in my constituency have made forcefully to me as well. But all these problems and many others make the case, I believe, for listening to what the European Court said yesterday and start to accept that no deal and the Prime Minister's deal are not the only two options available. Because as things stand, the UK government's deal and statement don't provide any hard terms or agreements for fishing rights in the future. They stated that the UK and EU intend to reach a fisheries deal by July 2020 in anticipation of... I will. Edward Mountain. I thank the member for taking an intervention. What, what it did say in the judgment that we would have to rejoin under the same terms and conditions. Does that mean we don't, that we don't have to, in your opinion, go back under the Common Fisheries Policy, or do we have to go back because it's the current term and condition? Alistair well, Allen. Obviously, if we, if we choose not to leave the uh, European Union, uh, then the court case makes clear we would stay in on our current terms. Uh, I, I have never expressed any uh, affection for the European Common Fisheries Policy. On that one thing, we can probably agree. Uh, but I think uh, the, the court uh, ruling was pretty unambiguous that we would stay in on our, our current terms. But what I want to say is that what I want to say though is that the, uh, they've stated that the EU, UK and EU uh, intend to reach a fisheries deal by July 2020 in anticipation of the transition deal's expiry. Now I am assuming for the moment that the UK government still thinks there is going to be a transition period. But many fishermen do worry that these vague provisions mean the UK government intends to forfeit access to British fishing territories to EU nations in exchange for an EU trade deal. It is understandable why they might have those fears. It is against this chaotic backdrop that the present... Uh, I'll, yes, I will, yeah. Peter Chapman. Do you not accept that we have made it abundantly clear in every opportunity, at every occasion, that we will not link access to our waters to, the, to the, the, the market for fish in Europe. We've said it and we've said it again. Alistair Allen. Well, I, I certainly think that there's, there's room for more than some ambiguity about that one because um, it's uh, been uh, made abundantly clear in the political declaration uh, in the wording of that that uh, there does appear to be a link being made. And as far as I can see, the UK government has already agreed that future agreement will cover access to UK and Scottish water and shares. There are many unanswered questions about that, and it's a significant concession uh, on the, the, government, the UK government's part to indicate that access and shares will to some degree be traded away before annual coastal state negotiations take place. Presiding officer, there is a great deal that is wrong with the EU common fisheries policy. Uh, I don't think many of us would dispute that. But the worst thing wrong with it is that Scotland has had no hand in shaping it because we have left that matter to the UK whose governments have consistently mishandled its development to the point where they now seem willing to trade away even their own limited influence over it. Make no mistake, Theresa May's withdrawal agreement prepares the ground for a betrayal of our fishing communities and our fishing interests. And the Tories look likely to sell out our fishing communities. 
And if I may have a moment uh, to direct some of my fire away from the Conservatives, can I say that it is of equally little use for anyone to tell fishermen that it will all be sorted out by a future UK government at an unspecified date in an unspecified way. The Scottish Government have been clear what we want. For fishing communities as much as for anyone else, other parties now need to start telling us what their policy is for the future of Europe. All parties must come off the fence about what those options are and what options they are prepared to pursue. And as we have seen, empty gestures on that are not enough. I have now lost count of the number of times that the Secretary of State for Scotland has threatened to resign from his sinecure if the UK does not leave the common fisheries policy by December 2020, something that is not guaranteed by the withdrawal agreement or by the political declaration. He also threatened to resign if any agreement introduced different arrangements for Northern Ireland, which this agreement does. Presiding officer, despite the Tories bluster, we can see where fishing features in the UK government's priorities. The remark leaked from them on the 22nd of November described fishing as a low priority for the UK government in leaving the EU, just as in 1970 they described it as expendable on the way into the EU. Presiding officer, Scotland's fishermen can be assured that the Scottish government will fight their corner in Europe, while the UK government fight nobody but themselves. Yeah. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Maureen Watt. Ms Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. The turmoil around Brexit will be deeply concerning to many people who live and work around our coast and are involved in not only the fishing industry itself, but in processing, in transport, in wholesale and retail. This makes the Scottish Government's role all the more important in this year's Council, providing a steer clear, we hope, for a future industry which is sustainable regardless of the EU exit outcome. I'm very pleased to speak in this debate and also to approach it um, in the main from a perspective of my brief as spokesperson for Scottish Labour for Environment and Climate Change. And my thanks go to Open Seas, the Marine Conservation Society, RSPB Scotland and Scottish Wildlife Trust for their helpful input into preparing for this debate. Like many across this chamber, I feel very firmly that sustainable fishing uh, make, makes for a sustainable industry and makes for sustainable communities as well. Coastal communities can and often are be fragile communities and economies and depend very much on these negotiations and the Scottish Government direction and they must be given certainty of science and the tools to fish appropriately in their local marine environments and more widely. The marine environment is indeed precious but its vulnerability can be forgotten or even misunderstood by the public and even sometimes by us policymakers, because it is very difficult to see with our own eyes. The way to really sustain communities is to manage ecosystems which enable productivity now and in the future. It is a sensible option. Everyone wins with clean, healthy seas. This time last year, the Cabinet Secretary assured the Chamber that, I quote, one of, Scotland, one of the Scottish Government's key negotiating principles is to follow the best scientific advice. Tavish, Scott, Tavish Scott's amendment today recognises that same importance, not least in relation to climate change and its effect on changing uh, fish shoals and migration. Given this welcome commitment by the Cabinet Secretary, can he comment on the lack of stock assessment for species which has... Um, which, for which it has sole responsibility. What plans does the Scottish Government have to gather that data for species such as scallops so it can truly say that it acts on sound science? Scallops, of course, have been in the news recently with the alleged illegal dredging in Westeros and elsewhere. It only takes one boat wrongfully dredging through an important habitat that can cause decades' worth of damage in just a few hours. I welcome the Government's condemnation of the reports, but the solution... Has been, has been raised a number of times, including in these yearly debates, of which I may not have taken part in 12, like my colleague Stuart Stevenson, but now six. Vessel monitoring systems are being demanded by the industry and environmentalists alike in relation to MPAs and inshore fisheries. 
My thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for his answer in the Chamber last week, citing that, citing that £1.5 million of investment in tra tracking and monitoring technology will be available. Not only will that help a level of monitoring to prevent unwelcome transgressions, it will allow Scottish leadership in verifying the quality and sustainability of our produce. However, Scottish Labour would need more details of funding arrangements uh, more widely for, for vessels in order to be able to support the Green Amendment today. Given that licences will be reissued in January, now seems like the time to make changes in this area, so we are not having the same conversations that we've had in previous years in next year's debate. The Chamber is well aware that Scotland has a vast coastline and is naturally suited to a thriving fishing industry, and as such receives the majority of the UK's quota allocation. But a third of that quota is allocated to just five operators. And I understand that some of this means landings of fish to foreign ports. This does not seem like the fairest arrangement of what is a public resource. And there should be ways to direct fishing licenses to smaller boats and fleets with a more direct local connection, as my colleague Rhoda Grant has highlighted. To consolidate this, while true that it provides a number of jobs, both direct and indirect, has meant that smaller fishing fleets and harbours can struggle to compete. What consideration has the Cabinet Secretary given to the issue of marine resource inequity, which Scottish Labour's amendment highlight, highlights, and Rhoda Grant's points about public ownership and local authority ownership as leasing models? Our Scottish, uh, amendment, our Scottish Labour amendment today also highlights the importance of new entrants to the range of fisheries. Choke species remain a difficult issue that requires some inventiveness in their solution. The landing obligation is a positive step towards reducing waste, bettering selectivity, selectivity of catches and ensuring there is a degree of accountability. Fishermen have made excellent progress with fishing strategies and technological advances to play their part but there are unresolved issues with certain choke species. In smaller ports, there is no market for these species caught by accident, and fishermen in these circumstances need proper advice and guidance from the Scottish Government. It was welcome the, that the Government guaranteed the funding for projects under the European Maritime Fisheries Fund in 2016, but the 29th of March is drawing near. This fund is immensely important in supporting fishermen in transition, to sustainable fishing, diversifying coastal economies as necessary, and improving the quality of life of coastal communities, while also protecting our marine environment, and the loss of this fund would be immense, not least uh, in, in terms of the support it can offer to training of workforces uh, for processing, and also for new vessels for this and the younger generation coming forward um, for fisheries to prepare them to fish sustainably in the future. So can the Cabinet Secretary offer any assurance uh, that this will continue to be replicated, although I do hear uh, comments on this um, from, from others in the Chamber today. Um, I, in the end, finally, I wish the Cabinet Secretary well uh, on behalf of Scottish Labour uh, in the Council deliberations, which will be so important for underpinning the future, whatever that may be. Thank you. Thank you. I call Maureen Watt to be followed by Finlay Carson. Ms Watt, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the first time I took part in this end of term December debate on the fisheries negotiations was in 2006 when I came into this Parliament. At that time, Ross Finney was the a Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries and Rona Brankin was his deputy. At that time, negotiations could and would go straight up to the wire on Christmas Eve and I mentioned that I hope Ross Finney had done his Christmas shopping already, or for, was he intending to try and get some time in Brussels to do it? Rona Branken mouthed across the chamber that she would probably be doing his Christmas shopping. And I thought that was above and beyond the duties of the junior minister. I see Mary Goujong turning round to me. Yes, Mary, you might want to check your job description. <laughs> However, over, the pa over these 12 years, <laughs> we've seen the nature of the talks change from being about maximum catch as possible to sustainability and a, and a much, much wider focus on the wide variety of species. 
Sustainability of fish stocks is key to the long-term viability of the industry. And because international negotiations seem to be stretched out over a wider number of months, we don't seem to be in the same position of going up to the wire as was the norm previously. Throughout these 12 years also, we've seen an increasing focus on discards and now the issue of choked species. I'm pleased that as an industry, there is now a better understanding of the work of ICES and an overall monitoring of fish stocks. And I welcome the much better collaboration of, uh, over information of the state of the fish stocks ra rather than the reliance on anecdotal evidence. But I think the Tories might just want to reflect on the fact that the total allowable catch applies to all EU members. It's the divvying up of that is what there are arguments about. Presiding officer, it is inevitable that <coughs> as this year's debate goes on, the subject will be dominated by Brexit and the shambles that it is. The power grab from this place by Westminster over fisheries is a complete affront to democracy and yet another sign of the contempt that Westminster, the Westminster government has to devolution of power to ad the administrations in Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland and the consequences thereof. And I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has written to the UK government about our fishing fleet's ask of, uh, of these negotiations, but also the Scottish Government's amendments that we wish to see uh, of the Westminster Fisheries Bill. And it's wrong to say that uh, the, the, uh, the sale of fish is not linked up. Why on earth did then the UK government put aquaculture into the fisheries bill? Despite the so-called red lines of the CFP, the ardent Brexiteers, as we all know, ha, ha, sorry, despite the so-called red lines on the CFP of the ardent Brexiteers, we all know how the fishing industry is always the least important to Westminster when deals must be done. We know that fishing is less important to Westminster than the financial sector, the car industry, and virtually every other industry. And very little is said about our fish processing industry and its needs. While the Scottish Fishermen's Federation is very vocal about the big boys in the fishing industry, in the fishing catching sector, little is heard about those vessels under 10 metres uh, who fish nearer to our coastlines and the very valuable shellfish industry, both of which are vital to so many of our coastal communities. Presiding officer, I have a number of fish processing industries in my constituency. And this is where the importance of the amount of landings in, the, in Scotland is really important, as well as uh, the catch, which I'm pleased uh, Claudia Beamish, Beamish uh, mentioned. Many or, or some of those uh, in my constituency have benefited from EU grants to expand, and all of them have a reliance on Eastern European labour and how the UK, even before the leaving date, has become such a deeply hostile environment rather than the welcoming country that we want to see on these benches really has been so sad to watch, but it also threatens the whole viability of the processing industry. I am deeply worried about their vital markets on the continent and most importantly, how those customers we will be as accessed as if it looks like lorries will be backed up at the channel ports. And that's why I support Angus MacDonald and Douglas Chapman and others who want to get the ferry from Rezaith to Zeebrugge up and running again as soon as possible. Our seafood products from Scotland are really valued in Europe. Anyone who has been at the huge seafood exhibition uh, uh, on the continent uh, can testament to this. And the Scottish stand is a must see uh, and the seafood sector there has, uh, the seafood stand there is really um, a, must, um, a go to destination there. Um, and that's why uh, Cabinet Secretary, I was pleased to see you you'd put amendments on the sea fish and the seafood levies uh, in, in the fisheries bill that, that definitely needs 
uh, amending too. So, presiding officer, I will take no lessons from the Tories in fi on fishing. I'm old enough to remember and have been active in politics since the 1970s. The SNP vehemently fought against the sellout of the industry then. I recall taking part of, you might well want to listen, I recall taking part in a blockade of well, fishing vessels of Excuse Aberdeen. Excuse me a minute, Ms. Watt, I can't hear anything because no, of what no. you're saying. So if you would just stop, I'd like to hear Ms. Watt. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. I remember taking part in the blockade of Aberdeen Harbour of fishing vessels right across the harbour. I can't recall any Scottish Tories being there as Ted Heath sold out the industry. The SNP's long-standing and well-known view is that the common fisheries policy has been damaging to Scotland's fishing industry. And we've continually argued that it's not fit for purpose and should be scrapped or substantially reformed. Our 27 manifesto pledged to continue to work for withdrawal from the Scottish fisheries policy. In 2011, our manif manifesto stated that the common fisheries policy was well past its sell, sell by date. Presiding officer, it was very telling that David Mundell was in Peterhead yesterday to try and show, show up that last remaining pocket of support in the North East, as elsewhere folks are seeing the Brexit, Brexit shambles for what it is. And they, along with the people in the North East, will never forgive the Tories for this shambles and very sorry episode of Brexit. Thank you. I remind members there is extra time if you need to take it. Finlay Carson, followed by Angus Macdonald. Mr Carson, please. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to be speaking in this debate at such a crucial time for the Scottish fishing fleet. Although fishing might only represent a small percentage of our overall gross domestic product, there are around 4,800 fishers employed on Scottish vessels, not to mention the thousands of businesses which rely on fishing in many communities right across Scotland and our United Kingdom. Fishing is vital for our rural communities and the, uh, the economy. Fishing is indeed greatly responsible for keeping the lights on on many of our coastal communities right around Scotland. When I closed for the Scottish Conservatives in this debate in 2016, there were 2,033 active fishing vessels in Scotland, but a year later this had gone up to 2,065, showing clearly how the industry is thriving. Representing Galloway and Western Fries, I'm acutely aware of the challenges that they face and how we must protect their interest as we leave the European Union. Indeed, my constituency is home to the UK's largest scallop port at Kirkubri, and I'd like to take this opportunity to pay my thanks to our fishermen locally who work tirelessly, often putting their lives at risk all year round, sometimes in the most horrendous conditions. Indeed, as I said in the debate last time round, it's often only when tragedy hits that we, that we highlight the importance of the fishing industry. And sadly, many of my constituents have experienced that when individuals have been lost or boats have failed to return to port, such as the Solway Harvester and the Mariel from Kakubri. The scallop sector generates 40 million pounds a year for the fishing sector. Sadly, this sector is coming under increasing pressure and criticism from organizations uh, like the green NGOs regarding illegal fishing inside areas currently close to fishing. The most recently have been mentioned already in, in Gearlock. The industry must not be allowed to be tainted by the actions of the few. The Scottish White Fish Producers Association wrote to the minister given that they have 30 scallop vessels in their membership and asking that he controls these rogue vessels by introducing vessel positioning monitoring systems on board all vessels irrespective of length and two other members have already raised this issue. The culprits are less than 10 metres long and land relatively few scallops. They're having a significant negative impact on the sector giving anti-scallop dredging organisations the opportunity to attract, attack the sector at large, especially on social media. Currently, it's only the larger vessels that are committed to vessel positioning monitoring as a condition of the licence. The Minister is committed to introducing such equipment on all scallop vessels, but has set a time frame of 2020. This is simply not good enough. We need it to be made a condition of the licence uh, at the earliest possible opportunity. Unfortunately, we cannot support Mark Ruskell's amendment because it only refers to Scottish boats. We would like to see all vessels fitted with these devices. And Marine Scotland possesses the force through its licensing to do just that. 
Given that the SW, FPA have written to the Cabinet Secretary and Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, requesting immediate action over the introduction of robust positioning monitoring equipment on all scallop vessels, ir irrespective of size, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary in the summing up can indicate what action he intends to take and when. The industry needs the support of the Scottish Government. This time last year, I was hugely concerned at the lack of urgency from the Scottish Government when it came to supporting our Scottish scallop industry regarding new proposals from the Isle of Man Government. Despite me highlighting the early concerns of the Kikubri fishermen in August 2017 that the boats were potentially facing daily catch limits and having to report to the Isle of Man ports daily, the Cabinet Secretary initially appeared not to take the concerns seriously. I had raised the issue with the Minister urging them to stand up to the Manx Government and defend the interests of fishermen in the South West, but it wasn't until it was raised sometime in December uh, that the, the position was sorted out. <laughs> Certainly. Cabinet Secretary. I, I mean, I really must correct the member's assertion that it's simply not correct that uh, I did take action swiftly and expeditiously, and that action, presiding officer, ultimately was successful. Finlay Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary and I agree, yes, his intervention was eventually successful, but the issue was first raised in August, before uh, uh, quite some time before action was taken. We need to protect the fishermen that fish within the regulations to ensure sustainability. We've got 482,000 square kilometres in our EEZ. And this morning, the A. Clare uh, meeting, uh, Callum Duncan, who I think is still in the, the chamber, uh, told us that Scotland is 5.6 sea and has 20% of the total coastline of Europe. However, we only have two marine protection vessels. I would suggest that needs to be addressed. Also, a huge and significant to the Scottish scallop fleet is the importance of barrier fee trade. As a significant volume of uh, shellfish, actually 85% is exported to the EU market. For example, our West Coast Sea Products base in Kikubri is a fine example, exporting to France, Spain, Denmark, Switzerland, Holland and Germany. I welcome the announcement this week from the UK government that when new fishing arrangements are put in place, increased funding for the fishing industry is going to be uh, around £16 million. And since the vote to leave the European Union in June 2016, this debate has certainly taken place in a different context for our fishing industry. And it's upon us on these benches that throughout the negotiations, we've stood up for our interests and made the commitment to leave the common fisheries policy, which has been hated so long by our fishermen. I was pleased to sign the pledge from the Scottish Fishermen's Federation committing to leave the CFP by December 2020 and enabling UK and Scottish fishermen to have complete control over our waters. I might have voted Remain in 2016's referendum, when it comes to, but when it comes to fishermen and our fisheries, then I recognise the sea of opportunity that leaving the European Union can bring to this specific industry. Not only will we be given powers back to our coastal communities, but we can follow the very highest standard of marine conservation. As a member of the Parliament's Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, as well as my party spokesman on the natural environment, I'm fully committed to ensure the highest level of standards scientifically led are met. At possibly the most important time ever for our fishermen, I'm proud to be standing up for them at every opportunity. We must ensure we get the best deal next week from what will be the last under the current arrangements. And we must deliver for, for, for our fishermen in the future outside the common fisheries policy. Failure to do anything else would be a complete betrayal of our fishermen. Thank you very much, Mr. Carson. I call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr. MacDonald, please. Okay, thanks, uh, President Officer. And I'm pleased to be able to speak in this afternoon's annual debate uh, on sea fisheries and the end of year negotiations. And I join Claudia Beamish in contributing to this debate for the sixth year running. Um, clearly, Scotland's blessed with enormous natural resources, and our seas uh, are part of that resource. Um, and they play a vital part in providing our coastal communities. Among, among others, with employment and an economy that supports their livelihoods. It's therefore important that we have the opportunity to influence and participate in any process that could affect the operation of our fishing industry in order to protect the industry, the jobs that it supports, and to ensure we can sustainably develop the industry's reliance eh, on sea fisheries. Of course, um, as we've heard today, it would be impossible to contribute to this debate without facing the calamity that is Brexit. 
Uh, and thanks to Brexit, this is probably the last December Council that the Scottish Government will participate in. Then again, maybe it's not. Um, we'll clearly all have to wait and see what develops in the madness of Brexit land, but there is one constant amongst all the upheaval and turmoil, and that's that the Scottish Government has been clear that they will take whatever steps are necessary to, to protect the interests of our marine industries and our coastal communities. Scotland's interests must be protected, and that means the UK Government has to make arrangements that will do just that. Clearly, as we've already heard, the best way to achieve this is to ensure membership of the single market and customs union is retained, eh, whilst ideally being out of the common fisheries policy. There is, of course, the risk that the UK government would be willing to enter into negotiations where they would simply look to bargain away the livelihoods of these communities, a move which would render all trust and credibility in their own arguments redundant, eh, not that there is much credibility, if any, left in them, uh, given yesterday's fiasco. But moving on from Brexit, uh, although I can't promise I'll, I'll not uh, refer to it later, it is crucial that sustainability is built into Scotland's fisheries going forward, irrespective of the shape Scotland's future relationship with the EU takes. I was shocked uh, to see footage recently of alleged scallop dredging in a protected area near Oban a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the actions of a few chancers are simply unacceptable, not to mention illegal. And I would hope that Marine Scotland will be able to identify the perpetrators if they haven't already and throw the book at them if they're found guilty. However, these issues are an example of the need to modernize the fishing industry, in particular through ensuring, as I've called for in previous speeches, the fitting of vessel monitoring systems to all boats, that full documentation is in place, including the use of uh, remote electronic monitoring and that Marine Scotland compliance is sufficiently resourced to enable effective enforcement. Now, these measures are key to ensuring our fisheries are sustainable and to clamping down on rogue and illegal activities in inshore protected areas. So I look forward to supporting Mark Ruskell's uh, amendment uh, calling for the use of robust vessel tracking and monitoring technology on all Scottish fishing vessels. Um, but can I say, I, I tend to have some sympathy with Edward Mountain, uh, which doesn't happen often, um, with his suggestion that Mark Ruskell's amendment uh, could have gone that bit further and apply not just to Scottish vessels. It is encouraging, to say the least, that the Scottish Government takes the enforcement of fisheries management and protection of the marine environment seriously. And I welcome the Scottish Government's £1.5 million pound investment in fishing vessel tracking and monitoring technology that was announced in October, as well as the fact that enhanced electronic monitoring for higher risk vessels operating near sensitive areas is uh, uh, coming in next year. And the tracking of vessels under 12 meters will be introduced from 2020. I can understand the concerns about the costs, but uh, um, I think uh, Mark Ruskell said it would be around about three and a half thousand, uh, which should be available from the EMF a fund or its successor, but that's if there is a successor to the EMF fund. We still don't know if that's the case. So as we move forward into what is effectively the unknown, it's crucial that we protect Scotland's interests in all areas, including our marine industries. This includes finding practical and workable solutions to issues such as uh, the choke species, uh, with West of Scotland cod and whiting being one of the most significant challenges when it comes to choke under the landing obligation, it is imperative that solutions to control fishing mortali mortality are in place, giving the stock a chance to recover. Further, ensuring that these solutions are simple and manageable and allow our fishing fleets to fish other species while encouraging adjustment, adjustment in their practices. Our seafood industry is remarked upon across the globe. A fish are landed on our shores and within a matter of hours are transported to the far reaches of Europe and beyond, building on the reputation of Scotland's produce being of the very highest quality. One of the largest markets of our seafood is, of course, southern Europe, and undoubtedly the biggest challenge to this is Brexit and the concerns that our fishermen and processors will be unable to get their produce to the markets on mainland Europe in time. Obviously, these issues are still up in the air at the moment, and for the sake of trading agreements, it really is an uncertain time for industries across the country, and not only uh, the fishing uh, industry, but uh, the marine industries as a whole. So the UK government cannot be allowed to sacrifice our fishing industry as it would appear to be prepared to do. 
Uh, from the clear betrayal of our fishing communities contained within the Prime Minister's widely panned withdrawal agreement to the potential, of further, uh, the potential to further gamble away access rights to our waters under a transition that will keep us in the CFP for the foreseeable future, we must consider every option available to us. This must include the ability to choose a different path ourselves and negotiate on our own behalf in order to protect our industries and the communities reliant upon them. In closing, President Officer, I'm pleased to see the Scottish Government is focused on securing the best possible deal for next year's fishing opportunities, while continuing to make the voices of those communities heard to the UK Government when it comes to sensible solutions to issues such as choke species. Although my own constituency has little in the way of fishing communities, none in fact, it does have restaurants and food processing businesses who rely on these industries for employment. And I'm confident that the Scottish Government has their best interest, interests at heart heading into these negotiations with such wide-reaching impacts. Uh, and I wish the Scottish Government success in Brussels. Thank you. Thank you. I call Lewis MacDonald, followed by yet another MacDonald, Gordon MacDonald. Three MacDonalds in a row. We couldn't ask for more. Lewis MacDonald, please. Indeed, presiding officer, that at least is a good auspicious sign. Uh, for the Minister's trip to Brussels, if he has so many McDonald's behind him. <laughs> Annual rituals, of course, have their place even in a Parliament. And one thing we know for sure is that this annual fisheries debate is going to be with us one way or another for a long time to come. Stuart Stevenson indeed reminded us not only of how often he's taken part, but even of what he had to say. And a number of other members have done something similar today. But in just the same way, we cannot wish away the reality of our geography, a large island in the midst of many smaller islands, surrounded in turn by the rich fishing waters of the Northeast Atlantic and the North Sea. Fishing vessels from these islands and from neighboring continental coasts have fished in each other's waters for half a millennium. And we know that that will continue for as long as there are fish in the sea. As the cabinet secretary reminded us, our nearest northern neighbours, the Faroe Islands, are in the midst of their annual round of fishery negotiations, even as we speak. This year's talks between the European Union and Norway staggered to an inconclusive close towards the end of last week. And as indeed Fergus Ewan said, there are just the same challenges and frustrations in these negotiations with independent coastal states as there are in the discussions among EU member states in Brussels. What the fishing industry in Scotland and the other countries of the United Kingdom want to know is on what basis future negotiations will be conducted between the representatives of these islands and those representing neighbouring countries. At the moment, Scottish ministers and industry representatives sit on the European Union side of the table in these discussions. The question is whether that is going to change, if so, when, and at that point, what difference will it actually make? In October, as no doubt many other members have done, I had the opportunity to visit the fantastic new fish market at Peterhead. I was introduced to many fishermen and fish merchants and processors by Jimmy Buchan in his role as Chief Executive of the Scottish Seafood Association. I have no doubt the Secretary of State for Scotland and even Mr Chapman will have heard much the same mix of views as I did when they visited Peterhead yesterday and met Mr Buchan. And I've no doubt, too, that the Cabinet Secretary and other members, all those members who engage with the fishing industry, will recognise them, too. Fishermen in the North East do believe there, is a sea of, there may be a sea of opportunity ahead, but the outlook is currently shrouded in a fog of uncertainty. Any skipper will tell you that the responsible behaviour in fog is to proceed towards your destination, but to do so with caution and an awareness of the risks which a false turn or a loss of concentration may bring. Fish buyers and processors are much more aware of the risks than many catchers are because they know how much their sector has to lose. They don't blame the catching sector for opposing explicit linkage between fishing opportunities and export opportunities, far from it. But processors feel just as strongly that their sector's interest in unfettered access to EU markets should be protected as well. As both Fergus Ewing and Tavish Scott said, this year's negotiation poses some difficult challenges, particularly because of the extension of the landing obligation and the impact of that on choke species. Those challenges will not disappear if we leave the EU. Our obligation to protect fish stocks for future generations will continue to apply no matter 
which part of which table ministers sit at. Much of the uncertainty for the period which these talks, current talks cover is about the proposed transition period because that is currently scheduled to run from the 29th of March 2019 until the end of 2020. Beyond that, there is further uncertainty around the proposed backstop agreement in Northern Ireland and indeed in the political declaration which the EU27 has accepted as the basis for future UK-EU relations. If no long-term agreement has been reached by two years from now, then either the transitional arrangements will be extended or the backstop arrangements will come into force. Either way, there will be implications for Scottish fisheries. Britain leaves the table of the European Fisheries Council if and when we leave the European Union. But British fishing effort and quotas will continue to be subject to European rules during the transition period. And the longer a transition period continues, the longer it will be until Scottish and UK ministers are able to negotiate on their own behalf with third parties and with the EU itself. In the meantime, we will have to follow EU rules and allow the European Union, which we will just have left, to negotiate with other neighbouring states on our behalf. The alternative to an extended transition period may be the Northern Ireland backstop, which envisages the UK remaining inside the customs area of the European Union until a permanent solution to the Irish border question is found. And for the avoidance of doubt, the protocol on Northern Ireland and Ireland explicitly excludes trade in both wild and farmed fish from the rules governing this single customs territory, unless or until the UK as an independent coastal state reaches a comprehensive fisheries agreement with the European Union including agreements on access to each other's waters and fishing opportunities. So the fog of uncertainty is not going to clear any time soon. We do not know what the Prime Minister hopes to bring back from her European tour. But we do know that after the fog has cleared, we will still be obliged to sit down with Norway and Iceland and the Faroes and indeed with the member states of the European Union to agree how to secure a sustainable future for fisheries in the seas around us. We need, as Tavi Scott said, to have confidence in the science and then to apply it. Whether in or out of the European Union, in or out of the common fisheries policy, fishing effort and economic benefits will still depend on the health of the seas and on catches, which must be based on scientific assessments of future sustainability, uh, and those assessments must in turn be as re reliable as possible. Those presiding officer are the realities for the whole sector inshore and deep sea, catching and processing, and we lose sight of those realities at our peril. Thank you. I call Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues who serve in committees who have an interest in the fishing industry for giving me this opportunity to speak on the fishing industry. As a member of the Economy Committee, I understand that the Scottish fishing industry is a significantly valuable sector of our economy. The number of active fishing vessels registered in Scotland was 2,065 at the end of 2017, representing an increase of 32 vessels or 2% of the fleet. Their catch consisted of demersal species, including haddock and cod, totaling 102,000 tonnes landed by Scottish vessels, Pelagic species covering herring and mackerel had 301,000 tonnes landed in 2017, and shellfish landings represented 62,000 tonnes. Together in 2017, the value of Scottish landings were over £560 million. The strength that the Scottish industry now enjoys is down to the determined efforts from those in the industry itself. However, the support from the Scottish Government over the years has and will continue to be crucial in building and sustaining its success. As this year's Council could be the last ever that Scotland participates in, we want our fishermen, processors and fishing communities to be in no doubt that Scotland's Government and Parliament will be doing everything we can to champion their interests and fight their corner in these vital coming weeks. The Cabinet Secretary has indicated that the end-of-year negotiations are complex and therefore, with my depth of knowledge in the subject, I will take this opportunity to highlight the concerns of Scottish fishermen and processors. 
Unfortunately, the fishermen of Scotland believe they are being sold down the river by the UK government. Theresa May's withdrawal agreement prepares the ground for a betrayal of our fishing industries and the Tories look likely to sell out fishing communities once again. Recent newspaper reports stated at Peterhead fish market there was widespread confusion, no thank you, and fear among skippers and buyers about what the futures hold. One fish trader from Aberdeen was buying up boxes of cod, collie and hake destined for Boulogne and dinner plates across France. He said, they're saying, here we go again, sold down the river. People are just so fed up of it, sick of it. They don't know which way to turn. We're getting empty promises from Theresa May, who isn't strong enough. He continued, I'm devastated. We had a situation where we were told it would be sorted in two years. We accepted that, and now we don't know what's going to happen. We just want clarity. Fishing leaders fear the UK government are on the brink of signing a Brexit deal linking access to fishing waters to trade. It would mean UK fishermen regaining control of their waters, but seeing huge tariffs slapped on fish sold through Europe. The coordinator of the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation blasted, I really wouldn't trust the Tories as far as I could throw them. Whenever it comes to fishing, it's always been a sacrificial lamb. He said, we rely on the smooth transportation of live shellfish into Europe until such times as we get clarification that it's going to continue we still have a huge uncertainty out there. We have huge worries. We are small individual fishermen working from creeks on the east and west coast. I haven't been encouraged with the negotiations I've been made aware of so far. Seafood Ecos said seafood processors needed to be able to employ EU labour and to be able to ship fish quickly to vital markets in France and Spain. He said, we're having fish here today, which is in France tomorrow. But from the French side, I'm hearing there could be delays of 48 hours going through customs control. That would be devastating for this industry. That uncertainty continued yesterday morning when David Mundell was in Peterhead. The Scottish Secretary spoke with a fisherman and told him about the vote that was going to take place this week, only for the fisherman to discover, in what must have been a mortifyingly short number of moments later, that there would be no vote this week. The Scottish fishermen have absolutely no reason to trust the UK government when at every turn they have sold them down the river. They were, going, they were told that fishing quotas would be a red line for the UK government. That line disappeared quicker than a Brexit secretary at a cabinet meeting. David Mundell vowed to resign if the UK stayed tied to EU fishing policies and quotas, yet he remains in post despite a hard Brexit or a no-deal Brexit, leaving fishermen worse off. Presiding officer, fishing is important to our economy and we can't trust this UK government. So this Scottish government should represent the industry in Europe in future talks. Uh, I see as we move to the, the last open debate speaker, that he's not here. Oh, you're not on my list, Mr. Halcrow Johnson. There's obviously been a change. Hold on till I correct it. <laughs> Terribly glad you are here. And I've wasted quite a bit of time. And can I let you know that there's still quite a bit of time in hand? <laughs> so the last of the open debate speeches is from Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm not actually used to being missed, so I'll take that as a compliment. Um, <laughs> I come to today's debate having reflected on the future of uh, an industry that, which has a long history in the Highlands and Islands, uh, my region. We remain, after hundreds of years, a centre for fishing. And there's more fish landed in Shetland than in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland combined. And the Isles with Galloway and Lowick are the second largest fishing landing area in the United Kingdom after Peterhead. On the mainland, we see communities along the Murray Coast, places like Lossiemouth, Burghead, and uh, albeit across the uh, electoral boundary into uh, the northeast, Bucky. These towns and villages were shaped by the historic attachment to the fishing industry. Still, the ties there remain, and they retain the coastal character that initially caused them to build and grow. And the Scottish fishing industry is healthy and continues to grow. Last year, we saw a small increase in the number of vessels heading out of Scottish ports. It's looking ahead to the opportunities for the future. However, it's not without challenges. 
It has faced several blows over the last century, not least the direction of the common fisheries policy. And the colleagues have already mentioned the cuts to key quotas which are planned for next year. And the industry must face the commercial pressures of fluctuating prices at market. Last year, for example, we saw a drop in mackerel prices, Scotland's fleet's most valuable stock. Yet fishing remains an important industry in regions like my own and in the Northeast, and is one that is viable and has a sustainable future. Just yesterday, I met with Lowick Port Authority, who lead an impressive modern port in the islands that continues to expand, having recently constructed a new pier and key area, increasing their capacity. And the Port Authority is also developing a major new whitefish market due to open in 2020. And I also met with representatives of the Shetland Fishermen's Association and the Shetland Fish Producers Organization. And there's real optimism for the future of the industry, a future outside of the CFP. And these uh, organizations are working together, bringing forward the infrastructure they need and planning for the future. Yet the decisions that affect their industry and their sectors must often seem very distant to them. This year's, uh, this year's end, end of year negotiations will be against the backdrop of a number of changes. The extension of the landing obligation in 2019 is one. However, I have no doubt that the UK's departure from the European Union will over overshadow much of the discussion and comment that will place, uh, take place this year. But we will be leaving the common fisheries policy, one that has been a target of decades of derision from our fishermen, and we will become an independent coastal state again. The fishing industry recognizes the potential benefits of this, not just in the immediate term, but the potential for future decisions to be made domestically. There is, of course, no question that we must exercise these new powers that will come back to the UK responsibly. There will be an increasing scope for us to look at the environmental impact and sustainability of our fishing industry here in the UK. This is an area where government and industry will have to work closely together to build a system that there is mutual, a mutual confidence in. I will say that the UK has a positive record on implementing sustainable practices and the effective husbandry of our seas. Looking forward, the UK government has set out how it sees a sustainable future for the fishing industry as part of its 25-year environmental plan. There are positive uh, early indications that change can come, change that is sensible and provides benefits not only to the industry, but to our natural environment and our wider economy too. The prize is clear. At present, UK, uh, UK vessels catch just a third of the fish stock taken from UK waters. If that proportion was to increase to the levels seen in countries like Norway, we could see an extra one billion pounds of catch filter through the industry. So this is the time for us to consider the challenges that the industry faces that we can address now. To give just an example, as Tavish Scott mentioned, Shetland has raised concerns with the Scottish government about freight capacity on the ferries from the islands to the mainland. The sad reality of this problem is that last year the industry reported over two million pounds worth of seafood being, seafood being left behind at the harbour in Lerwick due to a lack of freight capacity. With the new Northern, uh, Northern Isles uh, ferry tenders coming up, the Scottish Government has an opportunity to be bold and plan for the future in relation to freight, and I hope that they will seize that. Presiding officer, this year's negotiations are at a time when the Scottish fishing industry stand on the brink of a real opportunity, an opportunity unlike any we've seen in decades. Ensuring that we have the infrastructure in place for expansion will be an important domestic priority one that will touch on this parliament, as well as the local authorities in areas like Shetland. I recently signed up to the Scottish Fishermen's Federation's new Sea of Opportunity pledge, demonstrating my support to be out of the CFP two years from now. And I look forward with optimism to better years ahead for Scotland's fishing industry and for the sector across the Highlands and Islands. Uh, we now move to the closing speeches, and there is a bit of time in hand. Um, it would be nice if the closers could wax somewhat lyrical. Uh, up to eight minutes, please, Mr Scott. Uh, if something else would help you, I could read out uh, at some length the agreed record of the fisheries consultation between um, Norway and European Union. It does go back to 2016, but if it helps, it goes through a number of interesting issues across a, long, a number of species, including, of course, cod and haddock, but some we haven't mentioned so far, such as safe whiting place, Herring, oh, we have mentioned herring, um, anglerfish or monks to, uh, to those of us uh, who, who live this world, uh, horse mackerel, Norway pout uh, and capelin. So there are many uh, more minutes one could add to a speech on fishing uh, by simply reading uh, a Norwegian translation or rather an English translation of the Norwegian uh, text, including red fish in the Norwegian economic zone. Um, little has been said about that so far, but there's a very interesting Latin pronunciation here, which I can maybe leave the 
uh, leave Donald Cameron to deal with in his in his uh, in his um, in his wind up uh, uh, speech. More seriously, um, uh, uh, I, uh, of course. Mr. Church Stevenson. Yes, Nakariki Norsk. Tavish Scott. He's got that wrong, actually, but I'll, I'll not. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wrong species. Um, uh, some colleagues have spent some time um, in their opening remarks uh, talking about how many times they've spoken in this debate over the years. I tend to forget how many times I've uh, spoken in this debate, but I thought the best introduction was, the, was Maureen Watts in, in uh, citing the Finney Branking Christmas present Concordiat, Concordat, which goes back some years. Um, I don't know if um, the Cabinet Secretary is going to reveal his Christmas present strategy this year, but I rather reckon he'll be the one buying the presents for Marie Gouchon in the, uh, uh, next week in, in um, in, uh, uh, in Brussels, not least which because they'll be finished rather earlier than that particular one that I remember as well finishing on Christmas Eve when they're all worried about getting the last plane out of Brussels, uh, which is a, uh, certainly a, a, a moral of the story. Um, the, the important aspects to this debate uh, have, been about, uh, have been about the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, impact of the December Council decisions that will be, uh, will be made. Um, I think the less important parts of this debate today have been the ritualistic running through of, of yet another discussion about uh, Brexit. And I just want to deal very briefly, if I may, with the, uh, with the amendments. I, I take, uh, on, the, on the Green Amendment, I take the argument of Mark Russell's uh, making, but I, uh, I do believe, uh, like others, that that amendment would be, uh, as it were, appropriate were it to mention all the other vessels that fish in coastal waters around uh, not just the, the UK, but in this case, uh, Scotland, uh, too. And, and that would be the appropriate way to do that. His speech, in fairness to Mark Russell, seemed to me to concentrate much on scallop dredging and measures in, on the west coast of Scotland, possibly arguably than, than deep sea. But nevertheless, I think for that amendment to be, to be supported today, um, it would need to have mentioned and um, all vessels rather than just the Scottish um, fleet. On the uh, uh, on Rhoda Grant's amendment, on the Labour amendment, um, uh, I, I take up to a point her arguments around um, ownership models and what government should do and not do. I'm not a great believer in government must do everything on fishing policy or indeed fishing uh, ownership. Uh, and, and the other aspect I would suggest to her that does need some uh, further thought is that producer organisations play a very heavy role uh, it's certainly in my part of the world in exactly what she has described. The allocation of quotas, the ensuring that uh, uh, monies are reinvested because what happens in Shetland is that quota leasing policy allows money then to be re reinvested in new tonnage and in new entrants. I entirely take her point about new entrants, she's absolutely right about that, but what we are uh, after in that sense is ensuring the right uh, model and that may differ according to different parts of uh, Scotland and the different fishing arrangements. We have a share ownership model in Shetland. I appreciate that's entirely different from uh, the one in the northeast where there's a different, more vertically integrated structure to the ownership of, of the industry in the catching sector. But nevertheless, I think that needs some, some uh, further thought uh, to become a uh, practical policy. Um, on the Conservative Amendment, I can't support an amendment which is just about um, Brexit rather than about the Fisheries Council. That's uh, what this debate uh, should uh, be about uh, entirely, of course, except that there's a wider, uh, wider debate happening uh, right now and we can't uh, get a, a away with it. Uh, my, my concern about the about uh, what uh, the UK government we thought had negotiated and what we thought was going to be put to a vote uh, at 7pm uh, tonight, which uh, now is obviously uh, not happening, is that fishing is not in the withdrawal agreement. There is no legally binding text uh, to do uh, with fishing. And when I asked uh, David Liddington, the, in, to all intents and purposes, the Deputy Prime Minister at the committee here in Parliament a week or so ago, why fishing had not been included uh, either in, in the withdrawal agreement and therefore was in the political uh, declaration, he said that was a matter of uh, uh, down to the negotiations. Well, indeed, it is a matter of down to the negotiations. That's the point. The UK government didn't get what they said they were going to get. And, and we can all do the language of this and that and the next thing about this, but when it comes to it, the fishermen at home asked me, why wasn't it in there? If it was so important uh, to the UK government, why didn't they successfully have that in there? And it's, it's not for the Scottish Conservatives uh, to answer that. That's for the Scottish, the, sorry, for the UK government uh, to answer. But I think the very least the Scottish government, Tories should do is not defend something which the fishing industry asked for and didn't actually see happen uh, uh, in the outcome. For that reason, I'm certainly not going to, um, I'm afraid, support Mr. Chapman's uh, amendment. I did agree with his point on blue whiting, however. My understanding of that issue, and the Cabinet Secretary will know this better uh, than me, that is, there is a fairly complex business model uh, involved in 
the uh, blue whiting quarter and how that is traded it involves the Dutch and the very imp and the um, business uh, expertise that they have but what it, to all intents and purposes it seems to me is that we end up losing blue whiting quarter which the minister acknowledged in his opening remarks and then quite a number of, sh of uh, Scottish uh, quite a number of parts of the Scottish catching fleet then have to lease back in Saith which comes through a circuitous route I say that word circuitous route uh, back into Scotland so uh, the cabinet secretary I know understands that uh, argument and the more he can do on that to assist um, the Scottish fleet both in the, on the pelagic and on the whitefish side uh, the better and that was a point that Peter Chapman uh, alluded to as well uh, and, it, and it is uh, certainly important uh, for, uh, for, for that. Um, the other point I thought Rhoda Grant made um, importantly in the context of what's happening um, uh, next year and the year after, this is a point Lewis MacDonald went on to develop uh, uh, as well, is, is in 2019, of course, depending on what happens next March, there'll be no Scottish minister, whether it's Mr Ewing or anyone else, there'll be no UK minister indeed involved after uh, March. Uh, we've, we've been given some assurances, or rather I should say the industry's been given some assurances about officials keeping in touch with their opposite numbers and with the European Commission. But the most damning, the most damning assessment of the future is that there will be no minister at the Council next year in the way in which Mr Ewing will be uh, this year to represent Scottish fishing interests. Now, if that's a great triumph for uh, the UK government and for UK negotiation, don't tell me and don't show me what a disaster is because it would be without precedent. Whatever you may think of the common fishers policy, it is better to have, a, uh, to have ministers there representing our industries than not to have ministers there representing. And yet that is the practical impact of what's currently being negotiated. And I, for the love of me, can't imagine anyone who wants to, uh, to uh, defend uh, that uh, approach. Uh, one other, um, therefore, point, if I may, for the Cabinet Secretary is uh, there now have to be some um, very serious preparations for no deal, not least of which for the point that uh, Alistair Allen made, uh, because the prawn, uh, uh, the prawn catches that he re re uh, represents in his constituency and, and also down the West Coast and the logistics chain that gets all that across the channel um, builds into something like two-thirds of the catch uh, in this country that ends up in Europe. Uh, if we have no deal, um, which now has to be some degree, some degree of risk to that, uh, there will be delays. Uh, Gordon MacDonald is quite right about that. There will be uh, delays on that crossing, uh, crossing the channel. And um, the government of the day um, will have to uh, find ways to assist the industry uh, in that. And that's why I thought um, uh, uh, Lewis MacDonald's phrase, the fog of uncertainty, was a rather apt one for this debate. This debate. Because while we have uh, as, as much certainty as we ever have for a cabinet secretary going to these annual uh, negotiations and uh, knowing what is, sought, uh, is being sought to achieve, and most of us would broadly agree with his negotiating strategy and wish him well on that, there is a fair degree of uncertainty, the fog of uncertainty about next year. And that, for the industry above all else, both the catching and the processing industry, must be the biggest cause of concern. Uh, thank you, Mr Scott. Mark Ruskell, uh, around eight minutes, please. Okay, thank you, De uh, Deputy President. Officer. I'll do my best. Um, I think it's been an interesting debate here this afternoon. Um, the tone has perhaps been a little bit more thoughtful than I had expected. There has been a few moments where there's been some heated discussion, but perhaps the Chamber has uh, expended its quota of emotional Brexit energy already this year. Um, I suppose the question is, is this the, the last uh, of these debates that we'll be having uh, in December ahead of the annual horse trading in, in Brussels between the, uh, the ministers. Um, it has become an annual ritual, as uh, Lewis MacDonald pointed out, uh, alongside perhaps a spot of Christmas shopping with, with Rona Branken. But, I mean, the question is what will happen next year? Um, you know, will we have this debate ahead of the bilateral discussions with Norway, ahead of the tripartite? As the Cabinet Secretary spoke about in his initial comments, the dynamics now are, are very different to have UK and Scotland at the table. Uh, in the European Union ahead of these talks. And, you know, we have to find a way. We have to find a way to exert perhaps more soft power now on the periphery of the debates around the reform of the Commons Fisheries Policy. And that's difficult when ministers won't be at the table. Um, perhaps the most appropriate time to have this debate in future years may be when the science actually comes out. Now, uh, Mr Chapman uh, doesn't like the science, or rather he... He does like the science when it relates to Saith, Hake and Megrim proposing increase in quotas, but doesn't like it when it applies to Cod, Haddock and Whiting recommending reductions. 
Uh, Mr. Scott, um, yes? Peter Chapman. I, I, I disagree with that assumption. I, I do like the science. I think the science is very important. We have to, we have to, be, a, we have to be, uh, look after the science because we need a, an industry that's sustainable going forward. So I, I never said that. I, I, I did say that cuts to, to some of our most important species, given that the landing obligation is coming in, it could, could be very difficult for the industry. But I never said anything against the actual science. Uh, Mark Mr. 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 Chapman likes the principle of science. He just doesn't like what the science sometimes tells him in relation to stocks that need to be reduced. Now, Mr. Scott, um, again, talked about uh, the science, the IC science. Um, he said that some of it was on, you know, quite a shugly peg. It hadn't been peer-reviewed. And I accept that sometimes, you know, errors will creep in uh, with science. But I, I would point to him to the IC's website, where it talks about how they produce scientific advice. And it says here that... Reports of all expert groups preparing the basis for IC's advice are peer-reviewed by a group of independent experts. So, you know, we have the science, we have the scientific institutions, as Stuart Stevenson pointed out. We've had ICs for a hundred years. I'm sure he'll be uh, producing a members' debate on the topic, I'm sure, very soon, where we can look at that glorious hundred years of history. But, you know, we, we, we have the science. Um, we perhaps uh, don't have the ability to always listen to the science. Now... The reality is that, of course, this science does get tested to destruction. It goes through the uh, process of the regional advisory councils, where fishers and other stakeholders have the opportunity uh, to debate it. Um, so I think having a debate in this chamber, when we know the state of the stocks, the state of the science, uh, is an important thing to do every year. Now, one thing that would improve, of course, uh, on our knowledge of stock assessments is if we're undertaking more monitoring. And that's the point of the uh, amendment that I'm bringing forward here today. And it would underpin uh, our ability to understand what is the maximum sustainable yield for the various uh, fish stocks that we have, and indeed shellfish stocks as well. You know, we have a commitment uh, to ensure that MSY underpins uh, the exploitation of all our fish stocks by 2020. So it's important that we support that, and we can do that through monitoring. Now, I was pleased to get some, let's say, qualified support from around the chamber uh, for my amendment. Now, the Tories suggest it doesn't go far enough, uh, that we should be including uh, foreign fleets within that. I'll, I'll take that, that point. Um, and, but, you know, again, I put it back to the Tories now about how do you intend to then influence the CFP in these kind of reforms. I'd be quite happy to send a joint letter on behalf of myself and Mr. Mountain to the EU Commission, see if we can influence some soft power on the direction of the CFP from the outside, acting like a lobby group. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, but it's harder to do when we're outside the CFP. Um, yeah, I'll take an intervention. Yeah. Edward Mountain. Sorry, just to, just to be clear, that post uh, the Common Fisheries Policy, those boats that come into water that are controlled by Scotland will have to be issued licenses, as I understand it, by the Scottish Government. So one of the restrictions on the license could be that they have monitoring gear. I don't think it needs the EU to do that. Perhaps it needs the Cabinet Secretary to, and perhaps he'll acknowledge that. Mark Prescott. Well, it's a good point, but of course we need regulatory alignment across the EU, and that means Scottish boats having a vessel monitoring when, of course, they fish in other waters as well. You know, this is the point, really, of having a common fisheries policy, is that fish swim between borders, and we need to have alignment between uh, coastal states. So, you know, in many ways, Mr. Mount is making an argument for more integration, more policy integration across the European Union, which, of course, I support. Now, the Labour Party say that perhaps this amendment around vessel monitoring is going a, bit, a little bit too fast. Um, but I would hope that uh, Rhoda would um, acknowledge the urgency of adopting vessel monitoring, certainly for sectors such as scallop dredging. Her colleague, Cla Claudia Beamish, acknowledged the uh, tragedy that's happened in Loch Carron um, and said that there, are, there were decades' worth of damage um, caused in just a few days. So it's important that those sectors adopt vessel monitoring. It's important that the larger fleets, the pelagic uh, boats, and that the whitefish uh, sector also adopt that vessel monitoring. And there will be benefits for the industry. And a number of members have pointed to that, including Angus MacDonald, who, of course, has been a, a constant champion uh, for vessel monitoring uh, in many debates. Um, we, we have, of course, discussed uh, the issue of access to markets and access uh, to waters. This was mentioned by many members, you know, Maureen Watt and Angus MacDonald again. Of course, it would have been uh, unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable, presiding officer, for the EU to have uh, agreed to any deal which had excluded EU 27 boats from UK waters, while at the same time 
uh, allowing 80% of the UK's sea fish products to travel to the EU tariff-free. You cannot separate market from access to waters. You know, there's, there's been members in this chamber who've been saying this for years, and yet we've, some parties here have been under a delusion that suddenly we have a sea of opportunity and we can choose the rules for market access as well as choosing the rules um, for access to waters as well. It's simply not possible. And, you know, to reflect on uh, the comment made by Alistair Allen's uh, constituent, uh, prawns need to make it to Europe alive. Absolutely. Unless that happens, there is no market. If there are trade barriers and there are delays, there is no market. And that will uh, mean that communities around Scotland will, will suffer. Um, signing off, so I'm, I'm almost approaching eight minutes, but um, I will just briefly uh, reflect on uh, the Labour Party amendment. I mean, we will, in the spirit of cooperation, be backing uh, the Labour Party amendment. I think it raises some thoughtful, uh, important thoughts around uh, community leasing and about how we ensure that communities get the economic benefit um, from quota. Uh, Rhoda's is right. Um, tough decisions have been made. Communities have felt the pain um, in previous years. It's important now that communities, in a broader sense, actually see the rewards um, from quota and rewards from this industry as well. So conclude, presiding officer, um, I, I think the most important thing here is to keep EU membership uh, alive, and that's why we won't be backing uh, the Tory amendment here this afternoon, and that's why the judgment on Article 50 yesterday was so tantalising, because it keeps the options alive for continued EU membership and the options alive for the sustainability and health of our fishing industry. Uh, before we move on, two things I would like to say. First of all, could uh, members please always refer to fellow members by their full names? Uh, it's nice to be friendly, but uh, for the benefit of the official report and for people who may be watching. And, um, the other thing I'd like to say is that members should always be aware of when closing speeches are beginning and endeavour to be in the chamber for the start of those if they took part in the debate. And now move on to Rhoda Grant <laughs> for around nine minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I've lost count of the number of times I've spoken in this end year negotiations debate, so I can't join the bidding war that was going on this afternoon. Um, however, I would note it's an important debate too that we, that we have every year. And the fishing industry might be a small part of the UK's GDP, but it's a huge part of our rural economy and we very much need to protect it because it sustains many communities and the damage, damage to the industry is also damage to fragile economies and if you take for instance that Shetland gains more from fishing than it does from oil and gas it just shows the importance of fishing in our part of the world. We must also bear in mind the dangers of fishing and make it as safe as possible. I think when we have these debates, sometimes we forget that fishermen are putting their lives at risk. A point made by Finlay Carson during the debate, and I think one we need to emphasize. I think too often we hear of tragedies at sea and we must invest in research and development into the safety of our fishing folk to make sure that they can catch fish, but that they can also return home to their families safe and sound after doing that. Can I turn um, to our own amendment? And I think it was um, questioned by Tavish Scott, and I think I, I need to um, clarify what we're talking about. The allocation of, um, mod of quotas and models of working, both in Shetland and the Western Isles, is really what our amendment is talking about. It's this kind of ownership that allows fairer distribution of quota. And when more is available, it also allows new entrants to come in as well. Therefore, it stops quota being sold off to the highest bidder, but makes sure it's retained within the communities for their economic development rather than enriching the few. And we've seen how that works very well in Shetland, where they have retained much of their fishing and are actually capitalising in that industry. And as we've heard today, are actually seeing increases of landing, which we need to, to be better prepared for. And hopefully I'll have a chance to come back to that infrastructure question later on in my speech. Can I also turn to the Green Amendment? Um, Mark Ruskell talked about um, it costing 3,500 to fit a vessel with monitoring equipment. And that can be a huge amount of money for a small vessel. 
And when there is little or no gain to having that kind of equipment fitted to a static gear boat, I, I don't see the point of extending it to static gear boats because all, all it will do is create hotspots by making their catches publicly available. Mark Ruskell. Um Can I thank Rhoda Grant for giving way? Um, would you not, would Rhoda Grant not acknowledge though that the MFF provides 90% of the funds for these installations at the moment and that actually the data that would be gathered by vessel monitoring would actually be very useful uh, for these shellfish sectors as well because it would enable data that could then be uh, put into modelling to establish a, an MSY for those sectors to ensure that they have long-term sustainable health. Rhoda Grant. I think um, these sectors are sustainable and in fact have led the way in sustainability, things like the notching of lobsters and the like. Those fishermen know where their catches are. They guard those secrets very, very carefully because that's where their living comes from. But they are also very willing to take part in sustainability options, as I said, the notching and others. I just think monitoring is maybe a step too far for them. So therefore our concern with that amendment is not that it only applies to Scottish vessels because larger vessels can already be tracked and monitored. But the am amendment is applying to the smaller vessels who already engage in good practice and is possibly a little over the top for those vessels. But I have sympathy for the amendment in that they are concerned, as Claudia Beamish pointed out, about illegal dredging. So therefore, I would have no difficulty for mobile gear vessels of whatever size to, to be fitted with monitoring equipment to help us make sure that the damage that we have seen, and it is a, it is a small minority of this community that are creating the damage, but unfortunately it leads to the whole community being tired with the same brush and therefore we need to stop that happening. But we also need to value our, our small under 10 metre boats um, and their value to the community, as Maureen Watt pointed out, because those are the boats that sustain um, our communities. A number of people talked about Brexit and while I was trying to avoid it, um, I don't think we can go through this debate without coming back and talking about um, what has been said today. Um, the deal we have on the table at the moment is the wrong deal for the fishing industry. I said that and nothing that has been said today has changed my mind on that. I think um, Lewis MacDonald was quite clear in his speech where he said, during the transition arrangements, it's the EU that rules. Uh, we have no say in what happens. And if we don't negotiate um, a comprehensive fishing agreement which builds on the CFP with Europe, then we will be subject to um, levies on all fish that are imported to Europe from the UK. And that is tying both um, our access to water with access to markets, and that is unacceptable. Um, and I think I should also point out, having spoken about Creole fishermen, that it's those fishermen that sell predominantly into the EU and have most to lose by tying access to, to, access to markets to access to waters. The big issue in this debate, I think, is the choke species, and we need to find a solution to this. We've been talking about this year on year for many of these fishing debates, and yet seem no closer to actually finding a solution to it. I think we have to do the swaps that uh, Tavish Scott talked about in his debate, but we need to make sure that that quota we gain for choke species remains in public hands so that all have access to it, so that we can continue to fish and catch the quotas that we do have. As I said in my opening speech, I support the Liberal Democrats' amendment on science. I think we, uh, people have argued we, we know about the waters, the science is good. Actually, we know very little about the seas surrounding our, our country and we need to develop that understanding and therefore it, it's important we build on that knowledge using uh, the institutions we have um, and also make sure that what we are basing our understanding of catches on is peer reviewed because we need to take seriously the information we do have to make sure that we protect stocks, not just for just now, but also for future generations. I think it would be absolutely wrong if we don't do that. If I can turn um, 
quickly as well to infrastructure. Uh, again, uh, Tavish Scott talked about uh, shipping from Shetland, and this is a big issue for Shetland, um, as Jamie Halcrow Johnston uh, talked about in his speech, that fish were left behind on the harbour, not being able to get off island. I wrote to the Transport Minister about this and had an assurance that the new tender would allow for expansion to allow the fishing industry to expand in Shetland and get their catch off island, which is most importantly. But we also have to build on processing. We need the processing infrastructure to make sure that the catch we land ha adds value and that we then encourage people to have careers in this industry. We have to provide the infrastructure for them to live in these areas as well. Um, and of course, as, as Lewis MacDonald pointed out, our processors are extremely worried about a Brexit because they are the ones that will have to deal with the trade tariffs and levies if this, if this happens and we go into a backstop stop arrangement. A quick final plea um, for um, Claudia's um, European Maritime Fisheries Fund, which she talked about, Claudia Beamish, should I say, having getting, getting leave alive from the presiding officer for using first names, apologies, presiding officer. Um, but it is an important fund and it would be good if the Cabinet Secretary, in, in <coughs> summing up, could talk about maybe what he foresees um, taking over from this fund that will help our fishing community. We all wish the Cabinet Secretary well in those, in those negotiations and indeed we hope they are finished in good time to allow him to go home and do his own Christmas shopping and save Mary Gujan that, that pleasure. <laughs> um, we, we believe at the heart of these talks should be sustainability and making sure that we have fishing available for our future generations. Call Donald Cameron for around 11 minutes please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's always nice to have more time rather than less time uh, indicated from, from, from the, the Presiding Officer's Chair. Um, I welcome the opportunity to close for the Scottish Conservatives in this important debate. I note that I closed the same uh, debate for my party during uh, last year's um, uh, debate. And back then I said during my speech that the current sort of Brexit negotiations will undoubtedly be a long process to get the right deal that works for the fishing sector in the country and that we must not allow our fishing industry to remain shackled to the common fisheries policy, which has scarred coastal communities. And I firmly believe that through that negotiation process, the UK government has ensured that taking back control of our waters has been at the heart of those negotiations. And I do believe that the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration that accompanies it delivers on a promise made to fishing communities right across Scotland as do the guarantees made by the Prime Minister herself in person. We will be leaving the common fisheries policy. That is more than symbolic. It is a reality that we will not only become an independent coastal state by December 2020, but fundamentally it will be for us to decide who fishes in our waters and on what terms. That is hugely empowering for our fishing communities. And as the Scottish Fishermen's Federation has said, the declaration gives the UK the power to assert its position as an independent coastal state with full unfettered sovereignty over our waters and natural resources. And I'd like to reiterate the remarks that others have made about yesterday's announcement by the Secretary of State, because I think it's worth repeating. The UK government have tabled amendments to the Fisheries Bill, which will ensure that there is a legal obligation on the UK Secretary of State when negotiating a fisheries agreement with the EU to pursue a fairer share of fishing opportunities than the UK currently receives under the CFP. Uh, the UK government are also investing an additional £37.2 million of extra funding to boost the UK fishing industry during the implementation, implementation period on top of existing EMFF funding. And that, that too has been welcomed by the SFF. Yes, of course. Stuart Stevenson. Um, is it not the case that fishermen were promised 100% control but of course, recognizing that having 100% control gives one the opportunity to trade and negotiate with others, that that is something quite different from the phrase the member has used, a fairer share. It could be argued a fairer share is 1% more than we currently have. What the fishermen were promised was 100%. Donald Cameron. Thank you uh, for that intervention. I, let, let me quote from the Prime Minister herself. On the floor of the House of Commons, on the 22nd of November, 
this year. She said that we would be an independent coastal state, that control over our waters so fishermen get a fairer share of the fish in our waters, and, and I quote, we have firmly rejected a link between access to our waters and access to markets. The fisheries agreement is not something we will be trading off against any other priorities. Uh, as I was saying, the UK government will also create four new schemes comparable to the EMFF to deliver funding for each nation in the UK. And in terms of the fisheries bill, can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments that he sees broadly positive outcomes. Unlike the agricultural bill currently in Westminster, I do detect a very welcome and constructive attitude from the Scottish Government to this bill. Importantly, the bill will empower the Scottish Parliament to lead on our own scheme. We are devolving more powers to this Parliament. As Edward Mountain mentioned, we will be able to regulate resources to ensure conservation of the maritime environment, marine environment. The Scottish Government will have power over licences and devolved administrations will be able to transpose regulations. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary acknowledges that when he closes for the Government. Because there remains a striking contradiction at the heart of the SNP's position on fishing. On the CFP, Mike Russell told the House of Commons Scottish Affairs Select Committee last year that the common fisheries policy hasn't worked and we need to get alternatives to it. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater with the Europe that actually works for us. So on the one hand, he wants to lead the common fisheries policy, but on the other hand, wants to remain a member of the EU, which includes CFP membership. Or in December 2016, when the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, quoted as, was quoted as saying that the common fisheries policy has not been a success for Scottish fisheries, and I recognise that there are opportunities outside of the EU for our industry. Well, I agree, and I think there are others across this chamber. In fact, people have been explicit about the flaws in the common fisheries policy. There are flaws that exist by remaining in the common fisheries policy, and the possibilities that exist for Scottish fishing when we leave the EU are endless, and yet his government and the SNP seem hell-bent on trying to keep us in the EU and in the CFP. Yeah. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to turn to uh, other issues um, beyond Brexit that have perhaps been slightly lost during this debate, because on the issue of the annual fisheries negotiation, uh, which is the purpose of this debate, we do, as a party, wish the Cabinet Secretary the best of luck in his role at that meeting and hope that he can achieve positive outcomes for the fishing industry and our coastal communities. Like him, we agree um, that there is concern among the industry around the reductions in quotas, quotas of major stocks. And we note the position of the Scottish White Fish Producers Association in particular, who state that the reductions are unhelpful at least and severely problematic at worst. They come at a time when the landing obligation comes fully into force. At the same time, we recognize the need that we should be able to promote a sustainable fishing industry that works for both fishermen and the environment. And as a Highlands and Islands MSP, I know all too well the importance of this. We had a great debate during the Crown Estate Bill about kelp harvesting. I was inundated with emails from concerned constituents, some of whom were from fishing communities. And I know there are strong feelings around the conservation uh, of our marine environment. But beyond that, I'd also like to make a plea, and I believe that there are members across the chamber that have recognised this in their speeches, um, Alistair Allen uh, and, and others, that when we speak of our fishing industry, we ought to acknowledge the areas beyond the North Sea, and we must look at the industry holistically. I know my North East colleagues won't mind me saying this, but the interests of the area that I represent are slightly different to theirs. Inshore fisheries, which concentrate on shellfish, are often forgotten about in this debate, but are absolutely critical to the local economy. And I accept, and I hope Tavish Scott will forgive me for venturing out of the deep sea and into the inshore, that is slightly off the issue of the December negotiations. But there are almost 1,800 shellfish vessels in the Scottish fishing fleet, which is almost 88% of the total fleet. The main player in this regard is the Prawn and Scallop Fleet, which is the mainstay of many remote communities from the Mull of Kintyre northwards up the western seaboard. And in the Western Isles, shellfish landings account for some 90% of total landings, with whitefish accounting for the remaining 10%. In Argyll and Butte, creel fishing and static scallop fishing are also prominent, and likewise are contributors 
to the local economy. And it's therefore important that we engage with the totality of that sector when looking at any new legislation on sustainability, as they will have a vital role to play, as well as the wider fishing sector. And I do uh, recall that in the 2016 manifesto of the SNP, there was a commitment to an inshore fisheries bill. And I just wonder if at some point the Cabinet Secretary could update the Chamber on that. Because ultimately, presiding officer, we need a thriving um, and healthy fishing sector, ensuring that stocks remain at sustainable levels and that our waters are protected as much as possible. After all, in 2017, Scottish vessels landed 46, sorry, 466,000 tonnes of sea fish and shellfish with a value of over £560 million. I'd like to summarise in the few, minute, few seconds remaining uh, what other colleagues have said. Peter Chapman spoke with great authority about the immediate issues. Uh, choke species um, uh, are a continuing problem. Uh, and I think, and I th I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is aware of this, um, but uh, I remember speaking and listening to contributions this time last year about choke species. Um, and there is still obviously a, a real concern around this. And I, I hope that that can be addressed. Um, I was very struck by something Rhoda Grant said in her speech, which is to remember the health and well-being of those in our fishing fleet. And it strikes me that um, we're almost a year on from the tragedy that beset the, the ship, the Nancy Glen, in, uh, in Loch Fyne uh, in January uh, this year, uh, which um, I asked the First Minister about during First Minister's questions in January this year. That is still a tragedy for the families affected by those deaths. They belong to a small community in Tarbet, and far from the security of this chamber, it is so important, presiding officer, that we remember those working on our boats uh, at, in very dangerous conditions sometimes. The um, other members, Claudia Beamish and Mark Ruskell, spoke about sustainable fishing, uh, and, and I think I've, hopefully I've covered that um, to some extent. In terms of the amendments, we will be supporting the government's uh, motion, uh, and we will be supporting the Liberal Democrat amendment. Um, in terms of the Labour Amendment, regretfully, we won't be supporting that. Um, it's our view that we have to wait before committing to how quota is, is divided up. And it would be premature, and I particularly concentrate on the last sentence of the Labour Amendment, in our view, uh, that uh, we made any commitments to, to, to how that happens at this stage, though we are very mindful, indeed, of the need to promote both new entrants to this industry and smaller community-based vessels. Uh, likewise, um, with uh, the Green Amendment, we, we are very sympathetic. Uh, we condemn any kind of illegal fishing on these benches and, of course, advocate for the use of increased technology if that can assist that battle. Uh, but as, others, as other colleagues have mentioned, we feel it should apply to all vessels and not just Scottish vessels. And to, to meet the point that was made by Mr Ruskell, um, we believe that you know, if you can operate international agreements especially on crime and policing, uh, without requiring to be a member of the EU, which we do, then that can, uh, of course, occur in terms of something like um, illegal fishing. So, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm slightly over time, the Scottish Conservatives wish the Cabinet Secretary well in his role at the negotiations. We strongly believe that there is a benefit to leaving the European Union for our fishermen, rather than keeping them in the CFP. We must take advantage of the benefits that will result and the fact that we will become an independent coastal state, we will decide who fishes in our waters and on what terms. And that is the prize that we hope everyone can get behind. Thank you. I call Fergus Ewing. Uh, up to 12 minutes, Cabinet Secretary will take us to decision time. Unless my arithmetic is flawed, uh, Presiding Officer, I believe this is the 20th uh, fisheries debate that we have had. And I've... Uh, thoroughly enjoyed the contributions of uh, members across the chamber and in particular if I may say so from uh, some of us who have been around since uh, 1999 including ourselves presiding officer I hesitate to use uh, the phrase old hands but uh, certainly we have benefited from the experience of, of uh, several members who have uh, uh, participated in these debates over many years and have built up a knowledge and understanding of the issues involved. And I'm very grateful for the wishes from across the chamber, the good wishes uh, to pursue uh, success in the current negotiations. This debate is first and foremost about that work, and that is the main theme of 
this debate. Inevitably, understandably, and quite properly, however, members use the opportunity to raise all sorts of issues on fishing, and that, that is absolutely fine. And I will try to, to turn uh, to, um, to as many of them as I can, and certainly address the, the uh, key points. Um, before doing so, I wanted just to touch on some of the other issues involved in the negotiations. As a responsible government, we have to take whatever steps are necessary to protect the interests of our marine industries and coastal communities. And it cannot always be assumed that the UK government in the negotiations, either in December or throughout the year, will necessarily pursue Scotland's interests. Sometimes they may not do so, sometimes they may be reluctant to do so, and on other occasions they may be reluctant to do so with sufficient vigour from our perspective. For example, at this year's EU-Norway talks, the UK government has once again been all too willing to use Scottish blue whiting in exchange for Arctic cod from Norway, and this is despite assurances from the UK government that their focus would be to restrict the use of blue whiting in favour of other currency stocks and prioritise inward transfers of North Sea stocks at this critical time. And as we've heard on many occasions, not one single kilogram of this Arctic cod comes to Scotland. Rather, 100% of the benefit goes to a single UK-based, non-UK-owned company. And to rub salt in the wounds, presiding officer, rather than fishing at all, that company then swaps it with other countries for fish that it then sells back to Scotland. Something that fellow old hand Tavi Scott spelt out uh, in his speech, and I thought it worth making the point, without malice towards my colleagues in the UK government, I have enjoyed, I think, a workmanlike relationship with George Eustace, who has attended uh, the last two years' negotiations. So we approach it in a constructive fashion, but it would be very naive to assume that just because we're in the UK, that means that the UK delegation always see absolutely eye to eye with our perspective. They don't, quite frankly. Uh, uh, and recognizing that, I think, is important for members. I have been, in, uh, since uh, having the privilege of being Scotland's Fisheries Minister, committed to getting the job done. In the first year, in 2016, where we were met with the challenges of the landing obligation, as uh, many members, uh, most recently Donald Cameron has mentioned, I ensured that we received all eligible top-ups to help our fleet succeed. We also ensured that the science industry survey work on West of Scotland herring could continue by securing a rollover of the survey total allowable catch, having faced a zero catch uh, advice. Other achievements include the introduction of flexibility provisions for Haddock and Ling, which allowed the transfer of quota between the West of Scotland and the North Sea, and inter-area transfers are a very important tool which can be used in order to address the problems uh, arising from the landing obligation, namely choke species. Domestically, I did challenge George Eustace to bring to an end the decade of top slicing of North Sea whiting that our industry have endured, and I expect that this year that practice will end, and I have drawn attention to Mr Eustace to that the importance of doing so in a letter that I sent off to him just this week. Last year, we had welcome increases in the five main North Sea stocks of cod, haddock, whiting, saith, and nephrox. And this year, these same stocks are facing reductions, with the exception of saith. But there is welcome news on the West Coast. After a large cut of the nephrox quota last year, uh, which I know caused great concern on the West Coast, we now look forward to an increase in that same TAC. This does highlight the unpredictable nature of these wild fish stocks, presiding officer, and our need to be able to respond as necessary. We have overcome a few such hurdles in the talks that have already concluded. Uh, we have, for example, found solutions for North Sea Hake, uh, a link to an increase in next year's quota and utilizing quota flexibility between the North Sea and Northwestern waters. And I could add that um, Part of that work related to a meeting that I had with Commissioner Vela in Brussels, I think it was around June, where we made the point that there was a very serious choke issue in relation to North Sea Hake, where we felt that the Commission's assessment of the signs had not actually followed the stocks which had migrated north in very large numbers. So we have made some progress on some of these issues. But it remains that we face, as members have said across the Chamber, a very difficult year with a very challenging set of scientific advice, which, as usual, 
we must respect when negotiating outcomes. Let me turn to some of the um, issues raised in the debate, and I think the landing obligation choke species is perhaps the main one, and I'd like just to say a few words about that, which I, I hope will clarify the approach that we take. First of all, it's important to say we, we are committed to sustainable fishing. Stuart Stevenson made the point very clearly that uh, the current day's fishermen are stewards of fish for future generations. Stuart made, Stevenson made that point, and he is absolutely right. Every fisherman knows that if they overfish now, they are taking away their children's inheritance. So uh, fishermen themselves understand the importance of sustainability and the principles behind the landing obligation to reduce waste, to improve accountability, to safeguard sustainability, as Mr. Ruskell, for example, mentioned, are absolutely correct. And that means we have to respect the science. Uh, as Tavi Scott said, we have to be ready to question, to challenge, to scrutinize, to carefully examine the science. And I was very interested in his remarks about suggestions which uh, uh, might improve that. I would say that, in fact, there are already quite a lot of there is already quite a lot of good work going on where ICE's advice, for example, is quality assured by their own processes. Marine Scotland scientists are at the heart of international science effort and they're well respected. And Marine Scotland support an ICE's interbenchmark in 2019 to take a fresh look at uh, the macro science and data. But I thought his remarks were, were very, very positive and thought uh, provoking. Um, in order to tackle choke species, we do need to devise solutions that are practical. I believe that these solutions do exist, uh, and they need to be solutions which can be, are not so complex and complicated that fishermen cannot understand it. The issue is serious. We share industry concerns about the need solution for solutions to be in place. There are a variety of solutions such as swap, bycatch, technical measures, inter-area flexibility, and others. Officials held a meeting with stakeholders on the 6th of September to work through options, and Marine Scotland officials uh, and others attended a meeting of the FMAC, the Fisheries Management and Cons Conservation Group, on the 13th of November. So all of this work, presiding officer... Excuse me, Mr Ewing, Cabinet Secretary. Could I ask those coming into the chamber to keep their conversations to a minimum, please? Fergus Ewing. Thank you, presiding officer. All of these uh, measures are taken extremely seriously. We are, in the Scottish Government, uh, resolutely focused on the day job. That's because it is extremely important that we perform it, and I'm acutely aware, as members have said during the debate, that the choke species issues are perhaps the greatest practical challenge that we face. And I just wanted to spend a little time to assure members that not only are we taking that uh, as a top priority for the talks uh, next week in Brussels, but we have laid the groundwork and we have achieved some success on matters which looked even worse several months ago throughout the year. I think Rhoda Grant made a very thoughtful, well, two thoughtful uh, speeches, and uh, I'm, we're inclined, albeit we, we have some questions about the technical details of the amendment. Nonetheless, I think in the spirit of showing that the idea that we support new entrants is very important. I think it's time that we recognize in principle that that is something that, that we should be doing. Uh, and therefore, we're happy to support Labour's amendment. In relation to Mr. Ruskell's amendment equally too, although there are some infelicities in the draftsmanship, uh, uh, I think I did make it clear in my comments to Claudia Beamish last week, and also in a speech I made actually in October when I made the announcement that tracking and monitoring is a good thing. It's a good thing for conservation, it's a good thing for fishermen. Tracking is where the vessel is, monitoring is what they're doing at the time. And therefore, the vast majority of fishermen who, as many members have said, are law-abiding uh, and carrying out vital work to their communities have nothing to fear and everything to gain. Um, signing off, sir, I suppose I do have to mention Brexit. It does kind of spoil the pre-Christmas spirit and raise the Brexit blues. Uh, but I do think that, that what has happened now is that the Conservatives have over-promised and they are now under-delivering. I think that's really the, the nub of the issue at the end of the day. And the spectacle down south of what's happening at Westminster, uh, the display of disarray is now so acute and evident that it's almost painful 
and embarrassing, quite frankly, to watch. But set that aside, presiding officer, here in Scotland, we're getting on with the job. I was very pleased that members of all parties wished us well in the negotiations next week. I thank them for those good wishes, and myself and my officials shall do everything we can to get the best possible deal for Scotland, our fishermen, our fishing communities uh, around the coast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on sea fisheries and end of year negotiations. We're going to turn straight to decision time. And the first question this evening is that Amendment 15096.4 in the name of Peter Chapman, which seeks to amend Motion 15096 in the name of Fergus Ewing on sea fisheries and end of year ne negotiations, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. Result of the vote on Amendment 15096.4 in the name of Peter Chapman is yes, 26, no, 83. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 15096.1 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division again, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15096.1 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 84, no, 26. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Our next question is the amendment 15096.3 in the name of Mark Ruskell, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, we're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 15096.3 in the name of Mark Ruskell is yes, 62, no, 31. There were 17 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the next question is that Amendment 15096.2 in the name of Tavish Scott, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 15096 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended on sea fisheries and end of year negotiations be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now.
And the result of the vote on motion 15096 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended is yes 67, no 26. There were 17 abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Angela Constance on the 60th anniversary of the ultrasound scanner invented in Scotland. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the ministers to change seats.